So this is the first step in the journey. I've ordered the materials to build the guitar from a luthier supplies. You'll have to find luthier supplies in your country, wherever you're based. I'm based in the UK at the moment. You've got to have proper tone woods. These two pieces were, are for the sandboard on the guitar. They're um, book matched, so to match up. Strutting block. This will be cut up to make the bracing that goes on the soundboard. Here we've got a piece of mahogany for the, the end blocks on the guitar. We've got some plans here. I'll talk to you about them in a minute. We've got some binding here for the, the sides of the guitar. Indian rosewood here. This is for the back and the sides of the guitar. Two bits of rosewood there. So those are the two sides. Piece of wood for the bridge. That's rosewood again. Mahogany for the neck. Okay, so you've got a, a piece of bone there for the saddle. And I've got a piece of bone there. That's going to form the nut. Guitar strings. We've got a, a piece here for the rosette. Some bridge pins. Curfing. The stuff that is notched and it goes around the sides of the guitar and it's there to give you something to which you can glue the back and front of the guitar. Glue, tight bond wood glue, truss rod, piece of headstock veneer, dots here for the fingerboard. Alright, so that is going to be the fretboard and that is made of the rosewood. Finally, fret wire. Okay, so a word about plans. Uh, here you can see a copy of the plans I used, which I got from cadguitarplans.com. That's C for Charlie, A for Alpha, D for Delta, guitarplans.com. This guitar guide is a general guide to build a dreadnought acoustic. So you need to decide exactly what uh, guitar you want to build. Google full-size guitar plans and you'll find a, a wide choice of people offering full-size guitar plans. So you need to decide which kind of guitar you want to build and then pick the plans. But uh, make sure that the plans are full-size on paper and that makes it far far easier to build the guitar. As far as the tools are concerned you will be able to see which tools I'm using as you watch through the film. My suggestion would be to watch through the entire film and then you'll see which tools were used and then just pick tools up gradually as you work through the project and this way you really will be able to build the guitar on a shoestring budget and you won't have to shell out to buy all the tools in one purchase. Okay, so first off we need to make a template. Um, it's a good idea if you've got a see-through template. A see-through template helps you to choose the best area of the soundboard. In the plans, we've got a, a guitar body outline. If I just roughly cut round it in scissors, with, with scissors. Alright, so we've got roughly, what it is, is basically one exact half of the guitar body. I bought this piece of acrylic, it's about two and a half millimetres thick, and to make a, a, a clear template from. I'm going to stick this piece of paper to the acrylic sheet using uh, just this, it's like a glue for gluing paper, you can get it in stationery shops. Um, what you need then is a fret saw for, you know, cutting fine detail go and cut the shape out, following very precisely along the outside of the line. Okay, so here we have the, the finished template. Now I'm going to make the soundboard. These two pieces have to be joined together. Originally this piece of wood was like that, it was like one piece of wood. Then they cut it like a slice, cut it in half into two slices so that when you open it got a kind of symmetrical mirror image of the grain. You'll notice that on 
a slice of the wood, the grain lines are closer together. And it's the part with where the grain lines are closest that you want to be the centre. What you've got to do is to get these two edges perfectly aligned. So when you put it together, all right, that they match up perfectly. The method I, I found that really worked the best was to have a perfectly flat surface. And what I ended up doing was taking these two bits of wood, just putting them together like that, aligning them, and then putting it on the, on the paper. What I'll do is I'll just have the, the weight of the boards do all the work. So I just put a, a finger, a hand here to steady it, had the sandpaper there, uh, held the sandpaper down like that, and just let the weight of the boards do it to keep an even, and that got a nice result straight away, you know? And then I did sort of find, okay, I need to put the sandpaper like that just to work on you know just work on the top bit slightly you know and then you, you the way you do it is you just make m tiny little adjustments hold it up to the light okay so you've got the window there I'll take these two bits hold them together there's no light there not a hint of light 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 keep going ah see a little bit of light there showing through so I know that I need to just take a little bit off around that area with a pencil mark. But you'll notice now there's not a, not a tiniest bit of light coming through. So the next part now is to actually join these bits of wood. So I've got two strips of newspaper here, five millimeter batten. Put the two halves of the soundboard together. See I'm putting a nail here, right on the edge. So ladies and gentlemen, the join. Now referring to the plans, you can see here that it says the top should be 3.18 millimeters or an eighth of an inch. So I got a bit of wood, just used um, you know, a regular general purpose saw. Cut the main one out, cut this out, and then hacksawed it down to the line, sort of sanded it there. Made sure that it sort of tapered in towards here, so this this bit is wider. You can see I cut a, I cut with a hacksaw, I cut a, a slight groove to get a ruler in then. Drilled a hole here, with a drill bit like slightly narrower, you know, so it's quite a, well, a pretty tight fit with the pencil. What we're going to do now is take the soundboard and bring it down to the right thickness. Okay, so at the moment I've got this set to a depth of four millimeters. Now I can see if I run it along the edge. So I can see it's not going on to the board at the moment. So I'm just turning the board over now, doing the other side, work on one side for a bit, work on the other side, get the pencil aligned with the ruler, four millimeters, work it slowly down. Okay, so I've been sanding and sanding, sanding one side, sanding the other, and now I'm down to four millimeters, so I'm going to switch to the finer grade sandpaper now. Okay, um, after what feels like a million years of sanding, finally got it down. 
Right, an eighth of an inch. So I've got that, and the, it's good that the pencil point is flat as well. I take this and uh, you know bring it on here, and just hold the back level. And just go up and down, and uh, as you can see, it doesn't write anywhere. So there we go. The soundboard is now at the correct thickness. Okay, so I've drawn the line down the centre, and uh, now I'm just going to use the template. Keep the template pushed firmly at all times, you don't want to let slide in around. That's that, the centre of the sound hole, and mark, make a mark in precisely the point where you've got the centre of the uh, sound hole. Alright, that's referring to the plans, the sound hole. If you refer to the plans, it says that the sound hole is exactly four inches wide. I mark the centre point of the sound hole according to the plans. I use just a compass, then I drew this circle. The inner one, which is going to be the sound hole. These are for the um, for the rosette, you know. There's this thing that came in the package, but I don't like that at all. I'm just going to go for for this. You get these strips. There's four of these strips, and you meet them up like that. That is three millimeters thick exactly. This outer circle that I've faintly drawn here is going to be the center of the groove channel that I'm going to cut in this wood using a router. All right, so that's three millimeters. So the center of that bit, the center of this bit is going to be on the center of this outline. I'm going to cut that out. Um, but before I cut this channel out using the router, I'm going to put a little bit of varnish. So I'm just, I'm just painting on a very thin amount, you know? All right, friends and neighbours, I got the end of that ruler on the middle of the trench where I want the trench to be. Then I go to the centre point, and you can see it's kind of like halfway between four and five. All right, so I've marked that. I've had to make a bit of a modification to this router. I used a fret saw and cut this section out because otherwise this centre point of the compass kind of thing was out here and it was too much of a distance so I had to have it so I could you know hold it down and still have it work and everything so I just cut a section out there but that point is bang on the same point. Practice on this bit of wood where I've done a couple of practice circles obviously that one's way too big. Um, set it to a depth of one millimetre, don't want to go any deeper and see what it cuts like. Got this board firmly clamped. I've done a few practice circles all right, all that they all look great. All a uniform depth of one millimeter all the way around. I'm gonna go for it. I'm gonna cut this trench out. I did a few rotations with it, you know, to get a nice clean groove. Just one wasn't. I found one wasn't enough. I went round a few times. I'm just sort of pushing this in here with a screwdriver, pushing it flush and then just tapping it. I'm just making sure it all fits in nicely all the way around. All in, so it all fits in nicely. That's the edge of the fingerboard there, and that's the sound hole on the plans, right? The fingerboard, I can see that the fingerboard's gonna come to there, and it's gonna be that wide, so all this is gonna be covered. So I don't have to worry about it looking messy there, because it's gonna be covered. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna call that good. Just run a little bead of glue along the groove. Double sheet of newspaper over that. Bonk this flat plank on it. Okay, so I've set this router to cut out a hole that's uh, four inches in diameter. I've done one lot on one millimeter. I'm going to take it a bit deeper now and do another round. Okay, I've gone a bit deeper again. Lowered the router a bit more again. Some sanding really brought those edges up. I'm going to cut a bit off the bottom of this as a reinforcing strip for the back. Um, so I'm going along here. It's a 16 millimeter wide strip I'm going to cut off. So I'll 
kind of thing now is uh, feathering the edges of this soundboard, just making them a little bit thinner, because apparently improves the bass resonance of the soundboard. Just sort of going round the edge. Okay, so this next part of the video concerns making a radius dish. The soundboard on a guitar is often slightly curved. In the case of this guitar I'm building, it was a 28-foot radius. If you imagine a circle and the distance from the center of that circle to the edge is 28 feet, then the outer edge of that circle is the amount of curvature that you need on the, uh, on the soundboard. It, you could probably, to make things a lot simpler you could uh, just avoid putting a radius into the um, soundboard altogether it probably wouldn't really affect the sound that much to be honest but uh, I, I did go with the, the radius that was suggested on the, on the guitar plans in this picture you can see here there's uh, it's just a piece of uh, chipboard it's an outline of the guitar with a central line and then you can see there's three points the first point if you if you're going from the left to right so on the left hand side there's one the first point that's one millimeter deep i did that with a router the next point is uh, 1.5 millimeters deep and then the final one is two millimeters deep and these approximate measurements will give us more or less the 28 foot radius that we're looking for and you can also use the same measurements in the building of your own dreadnought guitar <laughs> Okay, so you could see me using a power sander there to sand the channel that you can see in this picture. Uh, the channel went as deep as the uh, points that I'd previously routed, and I then used the and then I didn't touch that central line, and then I used a combination of the power sander and just sanding by hand to sand away the to 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 the sides of that channel to create a sort of bowl a bowl shaped dish in order to put the radius into the soundboard and you'll see how that happens later and I'm just checking here I'm using a, a straight edge and a ruler and that was exactly two millimeters there I'm checking to either side of the middle sort of uh, three quarters of the way to the right and then three quarters of the way uh, to the left to make sure it's a nice even curve. I've got 1.5 millimeters at that point just checking either side of it to make it sure it's nice and even and one millimeter there finally so that's good. Okay so now that I've got this dish created I'm just transferring the bracing pattern okay which is seen on the plans there onto the guitar so I've marked the center line on the guitar again down the middle as you can see so you know the distance from the middle of the sound hole to here is X amount I measured this degree using a protractor you know got the exact degree got that point then got the degree which is you know and just um, using a protractor and a straight edge a, a right angle straight edge you know I'm, de I'm basically transferring the uh, the design from here onto there so I know exactly where to glue the bracing on so I've now transferred the uh, design off the plans onto the, the back of the soundboard got it all laid out how it's gonna go so now I'm gonna start chopping up this uh, strutting block two of them <clears throat> and making the braces <clears throat> yeah so I'm starting off making these X braces the height of this you know the distance from here to here is 19 millimeters but you want a bit of extra height on it because you're gonna be chiseling it and sanding it down whatever well this is uh, just over four centimeters high and remember that the the grain of the wood should be vertical like that not like that if you get what i mean it's stronger like that you know stiffer like that brace is eight, um, eight millimeters wide so i'm going to cut eight millimeters all the way along here so i took them to a place down the road and had them cut to the correct width and to the correct height. You know, they're all perfectly eight millimeters wide. The actual height of the struts there is 19. I've added an extra three mil onto them, so 19, 20, 21, 20, they're 22 millimeters high. All right, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut these struts roughly to fit on here, 
and, and put about, you know, an extra extra centimetre either end. All right, so I've got my bracing blanks kind of oversized, you know, just sort of laid on the thing. But I'm just going to sort of like, you know, trim off a little bit. Okay, so I've kind of trimmed the ends of each brace now, so just that I know which one, which side up to glue it. And so I've got to make a curve. Obviously, I'm exaggerating the curve in the underside of this so it fits neatly to the foam ball when it's pushed into the dish, you know. I've used a couple of these bricks, right, to kind of push this bit of the soundboard into where it will be when it's when it's when the bracing is clamped on it. And as you can see, there's you know a bit of a gap here. There's a curve, right? Because the soundboard's meant to be curved. It's just slightly over two millimeters, isn't it? Basically, this brace has got to fit snugly against this but there's a curve in there you may recall earlier on in the film i bought like a bit of perspex to make the template out of all right so i took an off cut of that and what i'm gonna do is like put this brace get it lined up correctly i've also used a template to draw the outline of the guitar on this side as well just so, just so as i knew where the uh, bracing bits would would come to a stop i push it there and the point where it touches the soundboard is say like there kind of there and the point where there's no gap at all on this other end is kind of like i've marked those two points on the brace there and there so, I've got a piece of card here, I put a nail here, measure up that mark with a nail, stick a nail in at the point where there's the other mark. First of all, just draw a straight line, drawing a line here. Now mark the point along that line where the curve is at its deepest. At that deepest point, we know there's two millimetres we've got to go to, so get the ruler out and line it up. Mark that. Now get your piece of perspex. All right, so now it needs to be held against here and pushed. Push at that point where it's at its deepest, right up to the line. Draw in that curve. Looks like that. Deepest point there. And then tapers off like that. So if I put that curve, if I use a scissors now and cut this bit of card out along that curve and use it as a template and draw it onto the brace, we should have a curve that we want. Right, so now I've cut that curve out. Align the edge. Right, so now I've transferred that curve. See it there. Okay, so you'll now observe, planed up to the line, I've matched it up, matched up the marks again. So now it fits flush here, if I push it down here in the middle, it's fitting flush. So all the way along now, there's no gap anymore. So I'm now going to repeat that process that I've just shown you with each and every of the other braces to get them all to fit. What I'm going to do next is put some slots in these X braces. You've got two braces here that are going to come in. Two braces are going to slot in here. An edge there of the brace that a little slot needs to be made. There's an edge here, the slot needs to be made. Here and here. All right, so I've got two little marks like that. Cut down to the depth like that. All right, and then you can just sort of you can just tap a little neat square out there, and that's cool, isn't it? Okay, if you look at the plans, that brace there, which is kind of like going from the lower left-hand corner up to the right-hand corner, as I'm sort of following its line with the camera, as you can see, that is the brace that goes on top. Match it up as best you can. Um, obviously, important to get the, the angle right. A, a piece needs to be cut out of here. These two pieces are of identical height, so if I cut to halfway, I, I've, I've marked the lines of intersection, if I cut them to halfway and then do the same with the H strut, but cut from the other angle, then they should fit, you know, so there'll be a, a, a cut out of there, section out of there, coming out like that, and then over the one the, t the top, so there'll be another section coming out of there which will go, and then these two halves will kind of fit into each other. Cut it out using the same technique I use to cut out the channels for the those little slots for the braces to go into. So um, it all fits. Both both X braces are fitting snugly to the soundboard. 
what I'm going to do now is make some patches um, on the guitar, the plans. You've got this part here as a patch, here as a patch, here as a patch, and there as a patch. I'm going to use these offcuts from the soundboard, and the grain is going to go in the direction that they've been laid out. So this here, the grain is going horizontally, so here it'll go horizontally here. You know, for these patches, I'll have the grain go in that way, and it will go that way, and then that way on the patch. I've cut that patching out from the bits of soundboard that I showed you in the last bit of the film. So I've uh, made and uh, you know just loosely placed that final patch on there as you can see. I've marked like these two points here, two points here on, on there and the central line and I've measured that it's two, that, that hole there for the truss rod is two millimeters in from the edge and it's nine millimeters so I basically recreated that at that central point So I've got everything sort of laid there. Got the rest of the braces here. They're all curved and ready to go on. I got the clamps ready. I'm just going to um, take the braces and um, pare them down to fit into the uh, the slots here. I'll do one to show you, and then it's not exactly rocket science. Okay, so I've trimmed the ends of the braces so they fit into the slots. The the uh, the patches are all there. Drilled the hole for the truss rod. All right. So this is just a dummy run to make sure that the clamping method is going to work that I've chosen. Basically, I've got the dish on up on a couple of uh, bricks, and then through the sound hole, I've got one small clamp on the centre of the X brace. Yeah. All right. So I'd have another clamp here. Um, I wanted to make sure it would work because of, you know you don't want to be messing about with glue going off and then think oh my god I didn't do this that the other I've got my uh, tight bond wood glue so I'm just putting a little bit in, in the in the X brace there in there and in there you can see it dripping out yeah what a mess I've now rejoined that back up all right got it I'll start to grab quickly that glue okay so All right, so it's the next day. I'm just removing these clamps. Well, there we go. Seems to have stuck. So <clears throat> I'm just going to glue the other braces down, as many as I can with the amount of clamp clamps I've got. Same thing as before. I don't know if you can see that, but you've got a nice, nice little curve. It's also good here. You've got a, a little bit of a curve there going on. A curve. Going this way, you know, very nice sort of gentle, subtle curve. So all in all, I'm pretty happy with how that's turned out. I've also made like this capping piece here to go um, on the top of here, just to strengthen that express. So I'm gonna, I'll be gluing that on. Everything's all glued on now. He's given me a piece of maple for the bridge plate. Okay, so I've used the old ruler and protractor technique to get the bridge plate off of the plans onto this piece of wood. Alright, so I cut this out. So I've just drawn around that bridge plate piece on a piece of chipboard because I'm going to cut that out in order to press down on the bridge plate when I glue it so that, you know, the pressure is spread evenly. So that's the bridge plate glued in. Okay, so everything's on now. It's all the bracing's on, the patching's on, the bridge plate has been glued. So I'm just going to sharpen the chisel on here first of all, so just in the same way that I sharpened the plane blade, you know. You know, you can hear it when it's like on one edge on the edge. You need the flat bit there. A bit of a burr develops on the, on the, on the other side, so you turn it over. Keep, put it flat on the stone and rub that burr off. I'm just going to take a ruler, draw a line on each brace up to the correct height, bring each brace down to its correct height using a chisel.
obviously as far as like the taper I'm, I'm looking at the plans and I'm kind of seeing by eye that okay it needs to start tapering off here down to here so you know as far as the, the bit tapering off you know refer to the plans Okay, so I brought this brace to the right height, made it taper off on each side as it is, as it is on the plans to the height here. Okay, so I've worked with a chisel to roughly bring the braces to the right height and give them the right taper on the end. I've even gone for slight kind of scallop. I've actually realised I've still got a little bit more chiselling to do really before I start in with the sandpaper to get the uh, kind of arched shape to the, the braces, you know, I'll be forever sanding that so it's quick, quickly get the general shape with the, the chisel. If I look in, into my Gibson Epiphone guitar I can see this, the sort of arch top, you know, kind of, you know, if I was like to draw it in a, with my finger the shape of the brace, you know, a cross section it kind of goes, you know, it's quite a sharp sort of something like that you know so I've kind of got that into the the braces here so now I'm ready to sand okay so I'm gonna call that good Okay, so the sandboard's finished. So now I'm going to sand the edges of these two halves to make them completely flush without any light shining through. Yeah. When you put them against the glass, if you actually push them against the glass, flat, you get a much better idea. So I'm going to use this epoxy to glue the back together. It's better to use epoxy than the yellow wood glue because the uh, rosewood is quite oily. Okay, so coming up to gluing, same setup. Strip of paper, batten on top. Same system, got some screws here instead of nails. But um, get these two bits, just rub them together, get both edges. Need this bat on actually, pull it out straight away. Nice, nice tight fit. Got the, the book match right, you know, got the grain pattern matched up correct. A couple of strips of newspaper over that. Something flat to spread the pressure a little bit. I've got a clamp at the edge of this table. Let's have a look how this back has turned out. wood much heavier than the soundboard. Okay a quick word about using a plane. Make sure you only have the tiniest amount of the plane blade sticking out otherwise it'll start to judder and cause you problem and when it comes to sharpening plane blades you do it in the same way as you do with a chisel. Um, incidentally one thing that helps if you slightly round off the corners of the plane blade that will help you to avoid uh, making nasty marks on the uh, on the rosewood and on the uh, soundboard if you're planing the soundboard and as far as sharpening is concerned I just use a sharpening stone there's two sides to this basically you just need to have the plane blade and have the flat side of the angled uh, the angled bit you know have have the angled bit flat against the stone you can hear when you've got it wrong if you if you do it too much this way makes a different sound that's the sound you want someone is you know or if you do it to this way too much that way you can hear it's uh, the wrong sound so uh, yeah you want to keep the pl the plane blade nice so you're working on the angle bit and just keep going like that for a while and then flip it over a, a burr will develop on the other side so you flip it over then and have it flat and then rub that burr off and uh, then you're then you're good to go. Obviously, important to keep your plane mega sharp at all times.
get it plane down to, it should be 3.18 millimetres, so I'll get it down to 3.5 or something like that, or 3.2 and then just sand it off then. Okay, so I've almost got this uh, back to its thickness. It's just a question of sanding it down now to the, uh, the right thickness, starting off with a higher grit and then <coughs> moving on to a finer grit to get a nice smooth finish. So it's a pretty good join in terms of being invisible. Now I've got the back thickness and sanded, I'm going to cut it out, so first of all I'm going to draw the outline of it using a bit of chalk. Draw around the line. Okay, so now I'm going to take this 16mm um, strip. It needs to be something like this because the grain is going horizontally there, as you can see, so that gives it strength. So I'm going to glue this strip on now, so I'm just going to clean this surface with denatured alcohol. So okay. I've got that strip so I just down. used um, a piece of chalk, a ruler and a set square to mark the positions of the, the braces up. Curving the back will be simpler than putting the curves into the soundboard. You've got a layout there on the of the back on the plans. So the distance is we're talking about from one end of the brace to the next. So to there. Okay, so I've marked the center point on that line and then I've made a point that's two and a half millimeters because the depth of the curve of the first brace is going to be two and a half millimeters. Then take something that bends in a uniform way. Same way as I did before, you know? And then looking above push that to the edge. So if I just draw around that then we're left with a nice curve. So that's a, a curve there and I'm going to put that onto the brace. Here's one end. Um, I've transferred that curve then onto the brace. So that's the first brace. The next brace, obviously, you've got to do a new template. Two point five millimeters, three millimeters, um, two point seven, and then one point eight millimeters here. Right, so it's just the same old process, so I'm going to curve all my braces now, so you know how to do it. Relatively thin beads of glue, Ooh, like that. You see that? I'll spread it on with my finger, match up the central line. Nice symmetrical looking, okay, that looks good. So this time, put a protector under there. There we go. Okay, so I've got these two struts glued in. Strut glued in, and I've just clamped the other two in there. Same principle of clamping it to the struts to make the the back conformed to the curve in, in the braces. Okay, so got all the braces glued on, so I'm just going to chisel the braces to their correct height now and then sand them to that kind of arched shape that's on the plans here. That's the shape that they need.
Okay, so now that all remains is to just um, scallop the ends down in accordance with the plans. You can see on the plans that, um, you know, how they're, most, how they're supposed to look. Like that, the scalloped ends. I've um, pretty much carved those braces how they are on the plans. I'm just going to sand them down now. So moving on to the sides, it's just the old uh, thing of uh, having to get them thicknessed first of all. It is actually a good idea to wear a dust mask when you're doing a lot of sanding. So I planed it, planed it, then I sanded it with a power sander a little bit and then finished it off by hand with a finer grade. So this side is now at the correct thickness. You know, I've got this set to 3 thirds of an inch or 2.29 millimeters. If I run it along here, it doesn't write. All right. Okay, so I've got the sides ready now. The sides come book matched, like the back and the soundboard. They're originally one piece of wood like that, sliced. You know, you can see that there's a kind of symmetry because they're book matched. What you've got to do at some point, you start off thicknessing, so, you know, playing both sides for a while, get it within, say, a millimetre of the correct thickness, and then pick a side that you want to go on the outside, and that's kind of just like, um, you know, an aesthetic choice, bearing in mind that the sides taper in, you know, the back of the guitar kind of gets narrower to one point. So you can kind of sort of imagine sort of holding the guitar and looking down on it. As you can see, those two um, are book matched, so the lower side would go like that, so that, you know, these now is the same here and the same here. That would be the top side and that would be the bottom side. But my landlord's got this old uh, kitchen unit cupboard made of chipboard, which will, uh, I think, could, make, could suffice as a, as a mould. Okay, I've now got a pile of six there, and this, uh, I've got the other half there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to screw them together. The tempo would come on like that. So I bought some long screws. It's going to get cut out around here. So there's going to be a guitar shaped kind of, and then the this mark here is going to cut the excess off to make the mould not so bulky and heavy. So I took my mould to a place phoning around till I found somewhere that had a bandsaw that could accommodate something this wide. Paid about 20 quid. But it's all good, all good tight, nice perfect um, 90 degree angle. I also kept a few of the, you know, the cutout parts because I thought they might come in handy for perhaps raising the sides when I'm going to trim them and, and, and put curves into them. First of all, I drilled holes in this brown piece. Then I put the brown piece to where I wanted it on here, clamped it on, and then drilled through the holes. Then I put the clamp off, took it off, drilled a hole, you know, expanded those holes with an appropriately sized drill bit, which was the same diameter as those plastic roll plugs, and then pushed some roll plugs in, put the plate back on, did exactly the same this side, uh, sand the inside of this mould down so it, it meets up to the line. Yeah, so um, one thing you need to check is get a set square. Make sure it's all 90 degrees. If I'm As I'm moving this around, 90 degrees. Which is what you want, obviously, you know, it's no good if it if it's tapering in because the sides are so it's all good just going to make some waist expanders basically they just push against the sides around the waist to hold it to the sides of the mold you know while it settles and dries 
So you can see that there's, you know, they're shaped to fit the angle of the the sides. Do the same with the other one. Same sort of thing. Now I'm just going to use a set square to um, and just mark it off. Okay, so these waist expanders they'll be fitted here when the sides are in um, and then just tied together with a bit of string to hold them together. I need to make a bending iron. I went to a shop where they sell plumbing stuff and you know I got these pipes. I've also bought a heat gun. You've got to make sure that that curve is, you know, that the, ra the, the, the radius isn't too wide, you know, because you've got to bend it to that curve so the pipe can't be too thick. The radius of the pipe is, sm is smaller than the radius of that curve. So um, I've got the heat gun. I've drilled a hole in that uh, in the thing, so I've got the pipe coming down here. So I'm just going to leave these two bits soak in there. I've had uh, the gun going for a while. If I flick some water on here. It immediately sizzles and evaporates, so the, the temperature seems to be pretty steady. Keep it moving from side to side. Around that area where I've made that notch, where I'm going to try to bend it. Just, uh, you know, just uh, keep that area up. I'll leave that to settle overnight. All right, so I measured up with the centre line and I've uh, drawn a white line there. I'm going to cut that with a saw. All right, so I've cut one half to size, matching up the centre line perfectly. Just going to do the same thing with the other side now. I'm just going to use a bit of fairly light grey grit sandpaper to uh, clean up the insides of the sides. Because obviously, you know, they're going to be glued to to get rid of all the uh, any gunk, anything from the bending iron. Now I've sanded them down, I'll just clean them up with a bit of denatured alcohol. Clean up all the gunk off there. There's the end block, right? So the end block needs to go, you know, the grate needs to go in like that. Because the, the grain is obviously running horizontally on the sides and it's running horizontally on here as well. I've cut these two pieces, so they're going to go like that. Alright, so I've glued these two together. The grains all go in that way. So obviously that needs to be sanded down so it's totally smooth on this side. And also sanded so it's totally smooth on that side. All that requires now is to um, create... The, uh, the beveled edge, you know, so I'm just going to try to use a, a chisel 
to, to uh, put a bevel on both sides, you know, as it is in the plans. If you look at the plans, if you see, you can see the end block there. Now, uh, this back side of the end block for the bottom needs to be curved, you know, it's going to fit like that. I took the sides out of the mould, but you can see how it's going to fit. And I just thought the easiest way to get that curve is to put a bit of sandpaper in the mould, tape it down, and just go back and forth like that to get the, uh, the shape. And now it's, as you can see, it's taken on the curve of the uh, of the moulds quite nicely. Okay, so I'm going to make this top end block now, um, just following the dimensions on the plan in exactly the same way. Up here, this will go here, and then we've got the bottom block, which will go here. Obviously I've sanded this down to make it fit, you saw that, I did the same with the sandpaper up here. Okay, so got the blocks glued in position. You know those um, those cutout bits that were cut out from the mould. I've put them in here, two of them, to 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 raise the sides up. Okay, and I've decided just aesthetically look. You know, holding the, I took the sides out of the mould and had a look and uh, thought, oh yeah, that this should be the back. You know, so. Um, I want this top edge to be to be the back. I've got the this edge here on the edge of the side. There's the edge of the side, and the same here. This one. And if you look along, you know it's got quite a dome in it, really. And obviously the same on the back. You know that's got one hell of a curve in it. So. I've got that bit now because I want to use as much of the side as possible because I don't, I haven't got that much to play with in terms of space. I'm going to start right from the top here. All right, so I cut two bits of wood to the length of the body of the guitar. Hello, so I just got back from the carpenters. Um, he's done me my nice curve here, pretty good job. I'm just sanding these two together just to, you know, just to get them, make sure they're exactly the same. One smooth curve, you know, it just needs a little bit. They're pretty good. Just a little tiny bit, just doing that. I got this bit of formica cut more or less to size. So I've made my jig, just uh, you know, screwed it to these curved bits of wood, same on the other side, a couple of bits on the end just to uh, keep it stable, just screwed together like that. Obviously you've got to get it like this top block, you've got to get it so it follows the curve of, of the jig, you know, because it's obviously, you know, it needs to be slightly sort of curved so that the top comes down and glues onto it like that. It can't be completely flat. So, um, that's pretty good now. So I'm going to um, just very lightly sand those edges. Just to... Okay, so now the sides have to be slipped over in the mould and you might have to put in a couple of uh, supporting pieces because obviously uh, because the curvature has been put onto the sides to which the back will be glued the uh, sides will no longer sit uh, in the mould flush to the bottom of the mould anymore so you have to uh, put in a couple of uh, extra blocks you know so to get it to uh, sit steadily in the mould then you need obviously to uh, take account of how wide the sides are 
at the point uh, where you've got the end block on the neck side of the guitar and how wide the sides are at the other end block at the, at the bottom of the guitar where the end pin will end up going and so you need to take account of the height of the sides at both ends basically and then um, create another jig um, using the same method as the first jig was created so um, the curvature of the soundboard uh, on the side cross section of the guitar as it uh, as you've seen on the plans on the film so far that uh, needs to be drawn in onto two uh, batons in in the same way as the jig was created uh, for the to cut the uh, the, the the curvature onto the sides f to which the, the 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 back will be glued, um, and obviously that jig needs to be adjusted um, so that you're cutting um, not only are you cutting the right curvature into the sides, but you're also ending up with the uh, the sides being at the right height at both ends. There's a line going all the way across. So I've been to the carpenters, got me my wood cut with a nice gentle curve. And I'm just, um, these bits of wood, that they screw them together when uh, they cut them, you know. And uh, just I'm just sanding it down to the line. You know, I asked them to do it on the outside of the line, I'm just sanding it to the line there. Right, so I've got jig number two set up now. Okay, so obviously this second jig has been constructed to both put the correct amount of curvature into the sides to which the soundboard will be glued, and also to bring the sides to the correct final height. So there's those two things that you need to consider. There's two points where the soundboard, uh, you know, there's kind of two points each end. And between those two points, you've got the, the curvature of the soundboard that you need to put um, onto the sides. But you also need to make sure that those two points on either end are at the right height so that the sides end up being the correct height at each end and I've tried to explain all that as clear as I can so you may have to fiddle around with your jig and adjust either the height of the jig or adjust the sides in the mold to bring everything together so that uh, like I say both the correct curvature is put into the sides but also the sides end up being the correct height at both ends Okay, so got both sides down to the right height now. Okay, so it's now time to glue the kerfing in place. It's uh, a lot easier to do this if you soak the kerfing in very hot water for about half an hour and then use some clothes pegs to you know, clip it to the sides as you'll see in the film in a moment and uh, then it makes it far easier, far less likely to break when you're gluing it. And then if you cut it into sections of about six or seven inches, um, then it'll make it easier to glue it because obviously uh, the kerfing has to conform to the, the curvature that you've put into the sides using the, the jigs. <laughs> So what I'm going to do now is um, get a bit of sandpaper, wrap it around a bit of wood and sand all this down, re remembering to bear in mind the curve and kind of imagining the curve and angling, you know, it's not completely 90 degrees.
Now I just sanded it down, I've sanded all this edge down nice and flush with the sides. I'm just going to flip the, the uh, sides over in the mould and do the same on the other side. Okay, so I've uh, now got uh, kerfing on the top, all glued in and uh, chiselled and then sanded down flush with the edge, nice smooth surface. Right, so I've cut my slot out nice and central. I'm just going to put a bit of this wood that from I got from the hardware store to go in there. So I cut a section out, fit it in. Okay, so I cut my slot, I cut a piece of light coloured wood out, fill the gap so it just looks nice and neat and central now. Okay, so the sides are finished. I um, glued some struts here to reinforce the sides here, here and here. Same on the other side, just glued them on using the, the yellow wood glue and uh, then uh, just chiselled and sanded them to the shape that they're in. Same stuff that the braces is made out of. Alright, so now we're going to assemble the body. I've carefully marked the centre line on the top block here and I've got the centre line of the soundboard perfectly aligned. Same thing this end, perfectly aligned. I've got like a, a thin strut of wood here, screwed in here, firmly holding this, you know, to the sides. But obviously we've got these struts over length, the, the bracing on the top. So I've marked the places on the curving. I'm also going to mark the bracing so I know more or less how much to chop off. Centre lines aligned here. We're talking an angle like that. There'll probably be a f bit of fine tuning. Here we've got an angle like that. But I'm using a sharp knife here to mark the line on the curving. Okay, so um, I've cut my notches in the kerfing. You may recall that I drew a line. You can just see it there. That line that goes right around. That's the actual line of the of the uh, of the guitar. I'm now trimming these ends off to get them to fit to that line and then I'm going to trim them down each end to the same height as the soundboard. Okay so after a bit of trimming the uh, brace edges and fitting it on and seeing which bits needed to be trimmed down a bit more you know a bit of fine tuning I've now got this to fit nicely round, round the other side I've just got it screwed on with uh, a batten going over the side and that's how I'm going to clamp it I'm going to use several of those battens okay so um, I'm just doing a dry run the way I'm doing it is I've got these thin sort of slats and I've just screwed them into the mould. Well, seems to have turned out pretty good actually. Seems to have got a nice close fit with the uh, curving. There's a bit of a curve. More so there. More so there. You've got the curve going on here. Okay, so I've now sanded the edges nice and flush with the body. It's flat here, put some spaces under here to stop it rocking about, you know, and a, or, or potentially, you know, twisting it out of shape when I clamp the top on, you know, so this maintains its shape. 
and I've got those white uh, inserts pushing it out of the mould. You know, what I'm going to do is just align those lines. So you get the idea, do it all the way around for all the braces. Okay, so I've done a dry run, it's all screwed in, the edges fit nice and flush, so I'm going to go for the glue now. Okay, so it's two and a half that way and five that way. So obviously a corresponding channel has got to be cut in here. Just to be on the safe side, I'd have it sort of maybe four and a half millimetres deep, got half a mil sticking up. Better to have a bit to sand off rather than it being too low at some points, you know? Just sanding the sides, getting them nice and uh, nice and smooth, you know? Because when you pass this along the router, you know, it all needs to be nice and smooth, otherwise, it, you know, any lumps or bumps that you, that you, they'll get, sh they'll show up in the, in the, uh, the purfling and the binding. So I'm just going to go all the way around the sides and get them nice and ultra smooth. You know, you get a straight edge, you know, when you put it on, it's all nice and straight all the way around, yeah? I've got my true oil off eBay. Delivery, it was like something like £6.30. Got a nice 100% um, cotton old t-shirt here. Put a bit on the rag. Ooh, nice. Okay. So I've got four coats on. The surface is now protected, so I can go ahead and start putting these binding channels now. Okay, so you now need to acquire a so-called rabbit cutting bit for your router. That's spelled R-A-B-B-E-T. Um, and that is used to cut the channels for the bindings. And you can get the impression of how it cuts from this diagram. Okay, so the setup I've got here, I've got the router mounted upside down, screwed to the underneath of the workbench with a hole drilled in the workbench for the router bit to poke through. And the router bit, it's not that clear in this picture, but it's um, at, the, at the that pointy piece of wood, the router bit is at the end of the point. Uh, the round placemat there is just to give a bit of extra clearance so that when you're passing the dome-shaped guitar, you know, you're feeding it around, cutting the channels, it's uh, got enough clearance. And you can um, alter the height of the the bit using the setting on the router. And you can move this piece of wood, there's a closer view there, you can move that towards you and away from you. And so using these sort of two X and Y axes, you can alter both the height and depth of the cut as will be seen. So it's, you can see there's a recess and then I basically used roll plugs and screws to firmly screw it. Right to left this way. So the groove is a little bit too shallow so they, you just make adjustments until you get it right yeah. Oh, so yeah, I'm just th these are good. These nail file, the nail file you buy them, in, you know, in a chemist. They're not uh, abrasive on this edge, so you can get them in in the groove here. Just lightly clean up, you know. So I'm just going to go around and clean this up now with this 
on both sides. And then I'm going to route the channel for the purfling, so about two channels. Okay, so I've got all my channels grooved in. You have to do like quite a few passes with, you know, passing it around the router. Just want to lightly rough off those, smooth it all out so that the you get the purfling then. Here you go. Like this. Cleanly defined channels there. As you can see it's all nicely stepped there. Oh, so this is like really important this stage, you know? Really important to get that right, because if, if you don't get that right, it's going to look a mess. Some nice maple binding. So you get the general vibe of what it should look like, yeah? Right, so I'm going to go and soak these maple bindings in hot water now for half an hour. And then I'm going to bend them. <laughs> Okay, so I've dry fitted the bindings, they'll fit lovely. You know, squirt a little bit out, get the old paintbrush, let's see if we can't uh, paint it on, yeah? Because I only want it to go in certain places in this first channel. So I'm going to paint this in the groove, yeah? All the way along. <laughs> Okay, so I've got the tape off. Now it's a question of inserting this purfling. I'm just going to insert it. So that's what it looks like, just push fitted. It's not too shabby. And that's one side push fitted. So that's the purfling all dry fitted. Going to glue it in. So again, I'm just going to paint the glue into this. Uh Using this chisel just to gently tap it down. Okay, I've got it all glued in. I've smeared a bit of uh, sawdust mixed with glue in the places where there were tiny little gaps, you know, just to close those gaps up. It looks a bit of a mess, but hopefully it'll look good when, uh, when it's all cleaned up. It's quite good to have like a little cushion or a piece of foam or something to put the guitar on while you work on it. So it's not like on a workbench, you know, with grit being pushed into it. It just kind of helps to keep the surface clean and smooth. So all I'm going to do now is repeat the process, put the binding on the back, the rosewood binding, exactly the same process. So that's the join on the back. This binding here on the top, that needs to be all sanded down, sanded flush, etc. You can see how it's proud there, etc. That, that'll all get done in due course. Paste go in here with uh, these rosewood, this rosewood dust and the glue. You know, to, you, you know, to get a nice smooth creamy paste. Makes for an excellent gap filler, you know. And just rub that into the gaps then. Locate the old gapage, smear it in. Starting on the neck, um, you may recall from the introduction video that um, part of the package, this, this length of mahogany came as part of the package. But first of all, I'm playing this smooth and look for the best bit to use for the neck, the straightest grain. Okay, so I'm um, playing two surfaces flat. This is the part of the neck with the, with the straightest grain. So this will be the main neck. Okay, so I've sanded it smooth now. So now I'm going to chop it up, glue it together. Obviously, 
in accordance with the, the plans. If you refer to the plans, you've got this bit here, which is obviously the outline of the neck without the fingerboard. Make sure I've got the, you know, you've got it on the right side. Make sure you've got the grain going the right way. I've taken the neck in now, and I had it cut perfectly flat along here. I took it to the carpenter guy who had a saw to do that, and then perfectly flat along here. Okay, so here I've blown up the part of the plans showing the cross section of the neck and uh, I've zoomed in on the part of the neck which joins the body and you can see the brown parts are the neck and the dovetail pin of the dovetail joint uh, which you will be learning more about later in the film but don't don't worry about that for now um, and then you can see a lighter part shaded in yellow um, when you have the neck cut out it's best uh, you've already left a couple of centimeters each end uh, on on the neck um, so it's best to leave that yellow uh, to, to draw in a couple of lines to create that yellow area um, because you'll be cutting the neck again later on when you've calculated the angle at which to pitch the neck and uh, I'll show you exactly what that's all about. The point I'm making is to leave a little bit of extra wood on the end you know so leave that area shaded in yellow on the end of the neck and don't try and cut the dovetail pin out at this stage for reasons which will become clear later. Okay, so it's now time to cut the correct angle into the neck so that you've got the correct clearance and the correct height at the saddle position. Uh, but before we can do this, we need to make sure that the part of the body into which the neck is going to be slotted is perfectly flat. If I put a straight edge along here, it's higher here and higher here. I've got to get this area perfectly flat. Any light shows through, it ain't flat. Okay, so have a look at this diagram here. It's a cross section of the guitar from the full size plans. You should have a similar cross section on your full size plans. And if you place a long ruler along the neck then you will end up with uh, a gap between the edge of the ruler and the soundboard of the guitar and uh, th that gap if you're building a, a normal dreadnought sized guitar that gap needs to be 3.5 millimeters or whatever it is on the on, on your full-size plans it should be around 3.5 millimeters and this will give the necessa necessary clearance to make the guitar playable. I've got a saw, that's a straight edge, I, li I aligned it with this, made sure it was a straight edge, right? And then I just got a bolt and stuck it through. I've tightened it up so that if you adjust it, it kind of stays. Okay, and what needs to be done here is that one straight edge is aligned with the guitar side, whilst the other hinged straight edge is pushed down until it meets the 3.5 millimeter high shim and that way you create the angle that's that you need to cut onto the neck okay so i've got the correct angle now if i just press this down together with this bit of paper and draw a line here 
and draw a line along here. It's this angle that is the one I want, yeah? This is the angle of the neck here. But if I draw it on a bit of paper here, all right, and then take it out and then draw along this line. All right, I've got a measurable angle here. If I put the old protractor on, I've got an angle of 87 degrees. Okay, so earlier on we saw this diagram and I advise leaving a little bit extra length on the end of the neck that's going to be fitted to the body of the guitar represented by the shade the part shaded in yellow now that we have the angle we need which is 87 degrees it might be uh, slightly different on your guitar it might be 88 but generally it's around sort of 87 88 degrees what now needs to be done is you've already marked in the position of the 14th fret on the side of the neck if you've proceeded as I've instructed so far and that position is represented by arrow number one and arrow number two represents the point at which you should cut the neck at the angle of 87 degrees that rep represents the what will be the end of the dovetail pin and you can get the width of the dovetail pin obviously from your plans so you need to draw in a line um, on the face of the neck corresponding to arrow number two and then draw in an angle of 87 degrees and then cut along the point of arrow number two so that you've got the required angle of 87 degrees okay so I used a circular saw with um, a facility to cut at, at angles and um, drew in the, the 87 degree line and then cut it as can be seen in this picture. Next is to get a centre line on the on the face. I've sand all this sand this glue off. So here I have cut out the headstock from the plans and stuck it on to the neck. And separately I also cut out the fretboard from the plans and stuck it to the neck and I've made sure to align the, the position of the nut on the paper plans that exactly where the nut is going to be on the neck and that is important and once it's stuck down it's also very important to mark the position of the 14th fret on the side of the neck uh, quite heavily in pencil because you'll need to refer to that later I've um, sanded the headstock down, rounded the edges off, just sanded it nice and nice and smooth up here, nice and smooth there. From the moment you choose the centre line, it's important to maintain it throughout the carving of the neck. What I'm going to do now is trace the rough dimensions of the heel on here. Not trace, but draw. Maybe just uh, measure it from the other side. Perhaps keep it nice and flat. Draw the line in. That line I've just drawn represents that line. I've got my centre line there. So you've got the heel there. That line represents the point at which the dovetail comes in. You can see the dovetail is kind of roughly marked on there. So the dovetail is going to come like that, like that. But we'll come on to that later. That's where the neck joins the body. And this part is going to become the dovetail pin. All right, so I've got a rough sort of heel design going on there. That way, then see what happens. Ah, okay. Always make sure to keep it kind of perfectly vertical. 
take little bites. Okay, so that's the sort of rough shape of the heel. Okay, what I'm going to do now is look at the plans and cut out this shape here, which is the shape of the heel. See where I've kind of roughly drawn it on there? So I'm going to clamp this down now and start rounding this off with a chisel and then I'm going to go and buy a, r a rasp. This inner curve here is cut pretty much straight to the line. So I don't want to take any off this central part here. You know? This middle bit. That doesn't need anything removing because that is the guy cut it on the bandsaw out just outside the line. So I put a bit of chalk there, you know, just to remind me not to start chipping away at that middle bit. Or Okay, so there's my progress so far using the chisel. I'm going to get a rasp. Incidentally, I do find it's good to have my um, Gibson Epiphone there just to refer to, you know, I just sort of glance at that and then, you know, I don't get too lost in, in this then. Again, I'm going to mark uh, this middle bit with chalk because the carpenter cut the neck outline up to the line. So I don't want to take the neck any thinner than there, so I'm just putting the chalk in the middle, you know, just to remind me don't touch that area, you know. Anyway, we'll just go for a rough feel for now. This was Obviously, I'm taking care not to touch this edge because oh, the fingerboard, the sorry, the neck is slightly what. Remember when I took it on the bandsaw, I drew those extra lines, two millimeters or so, or one point five uh, to wider than the actual fingerboard. You know, make sure you don't actually go to that edge. You know, keep preserve that edge. <laughs> Okay, so that's my roughed out neck. Let it let it settle for a few days, like. So now we come on to joining the neck to the body. What I've been doing is preparing to make this dovetail joint, and I built a couple of jigs to help me to do that. I'll uh, show you how they work now. We'll first, we'll probably start off, I cut a hole there, yeah, just a crude sort of hole, it's not perfectly right angled or anything. And then I've got a, a, a leg of my workbench here, which I've made sure is perfectly vertical, you know, using a spirit level. So in here, you've got that hole, you've got this bit of wood, right, which I've, which I've put on a hinge. You see that there? So there's a hinge there. So. It this bit of wood opens and closes like that. And this bit of wood, I've made sure that I've put a spirit level on the side of that and I've made sure that that is perfectly level. And here I've just super glued a piece of cardboard. And if I open that up, look there, there's, you see that bolt and the nut? Um, I covered that nut in super glue and then kind of bashed it into the hole with a hammer so that nut is fixed. Then I screwed that screw in from the other side. So the idea, right, is that you get a straight edge and then 
take the neck, align it with the spirit level. If you turn this screw, it changes the angle of the neck. See, can you see that neck? It's changing its, it's, changing its angle now. And the idea is to adjust this screw so that the neck is perfectly flush, level with the, with the straight edge. The body jig is, see this, I've screwed a piece in under here and here. Take the guitar, body. I bought another router, this is a Bosch POF. 1200A and I chose this router because it was the best router I could get for the money I had. It cost me £63. It has a good guide bush that's held nice and centrally. Other ones I've seen for this price have a guide bush which is just held in by two screws on opposite sides. As you can see I've got the dovetail bit there fitted. Um, What I've noticed is that the distance between the cutter edge to which my ruler now is touching and the very edge there is 2.5 millimeters. So I've got to obviously take that into account when I'm making my template. Okay, so it's time to have a go at making these templates to cut the dovetail joint. On this one, this is going to be the female one. Basically, this, this solid line represents the cut that should be made, but because on the router there is a difference, like I say, between the edge of the template guide and the inner edge of the uh, router bit cutter, that's a 2.5 millimeter gap. So you've got to you've got to allow for that when cutting. I've got six millimeter MDF, quarter inch MDF would be fine, but make sure that your template is slightly thicker than your guide bush, so that when you take this put it up to the guide bush, you know, this template is slightly higher, otherwise you've got the guide bush marking or touching the, the wood that you're cutting, you don't want that. And I achieved that by putting um, a card shim, got some pieces of card, made them up to the right thickness, cut them to the right shape, cut all the holes in the right place, put it on and then screwed the base back on. So that in effect has made this base move this way, which means that this is now protruding um, less than the thickness of the of the template. I've drawn um, a center line here. It's all perfectly aligned with this set. This has got to be a perfect straight edge. And what I'm going to do is set up a straight edge along the sides in order to cut to that dotted line. So that would be the template. And then the actual cut would be 2.5 mil in from that dotted line, which is more or less that, that solid line. Now obviously I'm going to use a, a straight router bit to cut the template out with um, and the distance between the edge of the cutter on that router bit and the edge of the guide bush is 4.5 mil. So I'm going to have to set up something that's 4.5 mil. I'll line that up perfectly, 4 mil, create a little bit to go in there, 4 mil, create a little bit so I, I can buzz in with a router and cut something out. I know that with the straight cutting bit the distance is 4.5 millimeters so what I have to do is to get this look down over the top of it I've got it lightly clamped and then just sort of uh, tap it in slightly until I've got exactly 4.5 mil looking on the on the inside of that dotted line so um, and we're just going to route up here, up to here, just do this line. So, here we go, so let's rip. There we are, that's turned alright. Okay, so I routed a channel here, up to here, but I couldn't put this bit on because this was blocking it, so I unscrewed this, got the ruler, used the clamp and screw method to get this one right, and then I re-screwed this one back on. But I'm not going to do that channel again, but um, I'm just going to it's just there to make sure I don't cross a line now, so I'm going to come up here now. Bzzip, bzzip. Ladies and gentlemen, the female template. Yeah, so as I was saying, this template I've created now, if I place that onto the guitar side and cut it using the router and the dovetail router cutter, then it would actually create a cut because it's 2.5 millimeters 
you know bigger all the way around it would actually create a cut of the right size okay so i've just created a kind of hinged setup for my female template okay so we can uh, do some tests i've got uh, my little template jig there and just a piece of wood underneath it and Okay, so I've now changed to the dovetail bit. Okay, so this cut looks good. It's the right size in accordance with the plans. If you check the length of the cut and then make compare that to your actual side of your guitar, uh, the length of it it should just stop shy uh, just shy of the binding and uh, so you need to check that uh, the dimensions of the cut you've made are the correct dimensions as given on the plans and if they are then you need you need do nothing else as regards the female template you can set that aside and now we need to work on creating the template to cut the male side of the dovetail joints now take a measurement at the bottom of the female cut at its widest point as shown here. Now hold the female template firmly down on another piece of MDF and draw in the lines as shown here. OK, so on your piece of MDF you should end up with something that looks a bit like this. OK, now use a ruler to extend the lines that you've drawn in both directions so you end up with something that looks like this okay so we've already made the female or mortise part of the cut as you can see in this picture and the actual length of that cut is uh, for my guitar was 87 millimeters might be slightly different on your guitar plans okay things get a little bit more complicated here but uh, stay with me as we've already seen the widest part of the female or mortise cut was 46 millimeters and you can see at the top right hand corner you've got 46 millimeters minus 5 millimeters why is minus 5 well you'll recall that on my particular router the distance between the top part of the cutting edge and the edge of the guide bush is 2.5 millimeters so in order to cut a dovetail the, the male piece or the tenon part and have it at have it be 46 millimeters at its widest part you'd have to start the cut on a place on the template where the actual line was 41 millimeters wide and then you'd have 2.5 millimeters extra each side of that to make it up to 46 so if you look at the bottom of the triangle you can see 41 millimeters there these measurements might be different for your guitar but I'm just uh, using my gu uh, guitar to to show you how how the calculations are done so yeah you've got that line there 41 millimeters but in actual and if you cut the if you aligned the face of the neck to which the fingerboard would be glued to that um line of 41 millimeters as you'll see me doing later you'll see me aligning the neck later then as i say the resulting cut would fit entirely down all the way into the female part of the the joint but you actually don't want that you actually want it to be protruding five millimeters so what you need to actually do is to draw a second line in five millimeters uh, down where the triangle is slightly wider and you can see where I've put five millimeters in very small letters uh, there on the left hand side of the triangle five minutes so that second line that uh, which is slightly lower than the 41 millimeters line that's the actual 
that's the line to which you need to align the face of the neck to which the fingerboard would be glued in order to result in a cut at that point which is slightly wider than um which will result in in it being ending up being slightly wider than the 46 millimeters and then you can work as you'll see will happen you can work on the dovetail then to bring it down manually so it's that second line at the bottom that you need to uh, draw in and as far as the length of the 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 tenon part of the joint well the actual cut is 87 millimeters long uh, uh, the female cut so i would suggest having the male part be 84 millimeters long so three millimeters shorter so you haven't got the bottom of the male part of the joint you know hit the male part of the joint joint hitting the bottom of the female uh, part of the joint so if you leave off um, three millimeters then it will it should prevent that from happening while still creating a good solid join okay so we end up with this area shaded in yellow and that is the area that you need that's the actual the, the, that area in yellow is the actual dimensions of uh, that the template should end up being and so we end up with the final MDF template looking like this okay so we've had the theory but this is the actual practice of making the template to cut the male part of the dovetail joint so there we're left with that what I need to do is just hacksaw off on the outside of that line and just round it very very slightly and then just sand it make sure it's all perfectly flat And here I've just made um, a piece of wood that's pretty much the same dimensions as the neck um, all the way through, just so I can do a few different, uh, a few tests on something that's similar looking to the actual neck itself, you know. And then here I just made two little um, sort of slots there on either side of that square hole in order to take clamps, because I dare say I'll have to shift this male template about a bit to fine-tune the cut but the idea is that you just put one of these in here and then you can uh, you know clamp it down all right so let's cut a couple of test pieces and see what it looks like so you see that arrow pointing to that line okay so here on the actual template you can see an arrow pointing to a line ignore the other lines that line to which the arrow is pointing is the second line uh, on the previous diagram, the w not the 41 millimeter line, but the line that was five millimeters lower, um, as on the diagram. So it's that line, and and as you can see in the picture, the um, that's a test piece of wood, but the the face of the neck to which the fingerboard will be glued is aligned to that line. And actually, one th thing I forgot to mention is that you actually need to shift the um, if you look at the bottom right hand corner um, I've actually moved those lines back at the, e the edge of the uh, template back a little bit because obviously uh, you need the route a bit to start cutting at the line to which the arrow is pointing and if uh, because of that 2.5 millimeter gap I had to sort of move the the edges of the uh, of the template down a little bit um, but uh, the actual triangle triangular part of the template is is the same I've just extended the the lines of the triangle very slightly um, so that the router bit comes in and starts cutting immediately at that point on the line Okay, so that's with the straight bit. Unplug the router now and we'll have a go at uh, cutting the dovetail. Okay, so I've now changed to the dovetail bit. And here's what the resulting cut on the male part looks like. It's worked perfectly. 
absolutely perfectly. Here's the female bit there, right? Here. Here's the male bit. I wanted it, first of all, look how it slots in. Slots in there. You've got a gap there. See that little gap? Just what I wanted. And, lo and behold, you've got a... Um, it's not pushed all the way in. So the theory worked. So that's how you need to have it set. So obviously things didn't go quite as smoothly as I've portrayed in this film so far as regards the dovetail joint. In actual fact I ended up doing several tests and sort of fine tuning and shifting the templates back and forth a bit. You know there's a little bit of fine tuning involved and I would thoroughly recommend that you do several test pieces to make sure that the cut fits perfectly before actually cutting the the real thing on the real guitar. All right, so this is it. Here's the real guitar body. Here's the real neck. I've done enough tests. I drilled a little hole here in order to line up the center like this line so I could see the center line through it. Got it clamped in. All right, I've got my straight cutting bit set to a maximum depth of 2 centimeters. I'm going to do this in three passes. So, I have a little bit sticking out, do one pass, have a net, you know. Okay, so that's what it ended up looking like. Slots in. Quite nicely. You've got nice, you know, it's nice and flat there on that side as well. There's a little bit of chisel work I need to do to make it push all the way down. I'm going to mark this area with chalk. Yeah, I just want to remove, I don't want to remove the outer edge, I just want to remove a bit from the inner bit, so there's a bit of chiselization going on. I've got my chisel, obviously mega, mega sharp. So no, note how I have not removed chalk and therefore wood from the outside edge. Okay, so I've released some wood from the, uh, the inside of the edge. Let's check again. Let's uh, put the neck back in. Give it an old tap, the old rubber hammer. Okay, so I'm just checking the angle is still good. Obviously the dovetail is protruding 5 millimeters from the body. Um, I've got that shim there where the saddle will be, um, which is the uh, requisite 3.5 millimeters high. Um, so to judge the angle, obviously you take you measure the height at where the shim is off the soundboard, and then minus the five millimeters protruding to get uh, you know to get hopefully the 3.5. The other thing that you need to check is the center line running along the neck. And through the guitar so you do that like I'm doing here placing a ruler and making sure that uh, the line is one continuous line going through the entire guitars okay so in an ideal world your neck angle is perfect and the center line is smack bang dead central However, if, if that happens not to be the case, then some slight adjustments need to be made. <clears throat> if you take a look at this picture, you can see that uh, 
you can see the dovetail joints there and the the I've labeled the neck parts of that dovetail joint you can see I've labeled the shoulders and the cheeks and we'll focus on the shoulders first of all um, you use you make adjustments to the shoulders to get the neck angle correct and to get the center line um, lined up perfectly straight and in this case despite all the care I'd taken to cut the neck at the correct angle I noticed that the clearance whilst putting a straight edge along the neck uh, as you saw a few moments ago the clearance at the saddle position was slightly um, too high and so only very slightly and so slight in that, it, that being the case uh, a slight adjustment was needed to the shoulder so you can see me using a file here taking a little tiny bit of wood off uh, the uh, part of the shoulders closest to the face of the neck to which the fingerboard will be glued and it really is tiny tiny adjustments that you need to make um, uh, to make a big difference as far as the clearance at the saddle is concerned now obviously the filing that I'm doing here not only changes very slightly the angle of the neck but it could also potentially change the central line that runs along the neck and through the guitar the central line that kind of divides the whole guitar in half and so making adjustments to these shoulders has to be done extremely carefully um, because adjustments to the shoulders affect not only the angle but also the center line so you have to very very carefully work both sides um, you also have to be careful because you've cut the dovetail pin to the line which represents the 14th fret where the neck joins the body so you only want to take off the absolute minimum from the shoulders in order not to alter that line too much I mean that line can shift a millimeter fine you know but you don't really want it may be even two millimeters but you don't really want that to happen if you can avoid it so adjust like I say make minimal adjustments to the shoulders to get the angle the neck angle correct and the center line correct and also take care to make sure that the the surface of the shoulders remains completely flat because you don't want any gaps between the side of the guitar and the neck you know uh, whether 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 where the dovetail meets the neck you don't want any gaps there I started doing work on the shoulders using a file but I then switched to using a sanding stick as you can see pictured here uh, both surfaces of the sanding stick were completely flat so they made any uh, work that I did on either end of the shoulders I made sure I used the entire length of the sanding stick to make sure that the shoulders remained completely flat and just putting pressure at one side or the other to make alterations in the angle um, was far better than than using a file because it made sure that the shoulders remained completely flat so I started with a file but then switched to a sanding stick which was far better and uh, also allowed me to work I could use that sanding stick to work both on the shoulders and on the cheeks and we'll discuss working on the cheeks next okay so once you've worked on the shoulders in order to get the correct neck angle as well as the correct alignment of the center line that goes through the guitar you can then focus on the cheeks to drop the dovetail joint down so that the surface to which the fingerboard will be glued becomes flush with the 
with the body. Okay, so here you can see me using my sanding stick, which is as flat as flat can be, to work on the cheeks to slowly bring this dovetail joint down into place. It's just a process now of edging it in slowly. I find if it rocks at both ends, take a bit off the middle. If it rocks at this end, take a bit off here. If it rocks at this end, take a bit off, off the cheeks here. Centre line. Yeah, smack bang, perfect. So I'm down to the last few millimetres. The angle's perfect, the centre alignment's good. So I'm just working on these cheeks. I just want to slowly ease it in. Okay, my centre line is good. So now I'm flush here, I'm flush here, it's all nice one level. Alright, so just a reminder, make sure that this bottom here doesn't hit the bottom to stop it moving back because you'll be taking stuff off here and taking stuff off here trying to move it back when it's that. So make sure that doesn't bottom out. You know, you want to kind of work on the angle as you work it in adjust the, uh, make sure, check the angles okay. If you need to tilt it this way obviously you need to take wood off here. If you need to tilt it this way you need to take wood off here, off these shoulders. Adjusting the sides to get it to tilt that way or the other, you've got to maintain that centre line, the centre. Um, you just remove wood from the shoulders here. But again, be careful because removing wood from the shoulders could vary the angle, so you've got to keep an eye on that as well, you know? And it's just a, a question of then working on the cheeks. Every time you do it, push it in, bash it in with a hammer, and then check it. If it rocks at this end here, this point, it's too loose here, which means you need to take wood off the cheeks. The cheeks here, these are the shoulders, these are the cheeks, uh, down to this bottom end. So this makes this bottom end looser, which then tightens up this end. And that will drop it down a little bit more. If you find um, the, 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 it's rocking here, at the bottom here, then that means it's too loose here. You need to take a bit off the top, so off the cheeks on both sides. But be, make, make sure you, don't, you take an equal amount off. Keep an eye on it. You don't want to kind of twist that way. It's all these things you have to take into consideration. Just a bit of glue on both sides. Nice. Same on the other side. Nice and tight. No rocking. No rocking. It doesn't rock either way. It doesn't. It's not. It's not twisting. Okay. So that's good. All nice and flush. So finally, just get a clamp on it. So there we are. The clamp's on. Just going to take it in now and let it dry. Okay. I'm just. Um, using 120 grit just to uh, bring this perf all nice and perfectly flush as a tiny little bit. Uh, so I'm just bringing it all perfect, absolutely perfectly flush. It almost is, but you know. I'm also going on to the body here, just to remove, I put some protective coat of true oil on it, but I think that needs to come off in order for the glue to stick to the wood when I do the fingerboard on. So this area here, you know, just kind of, clearing off that coat of uh, true oil whilst bringing this flush as well. Next thing I'm going to do is use a shim, again made out of the uh, same material, mahogany, to fill the gap between, there's a slight gap between the end of this tenon and uh, mortise, the edge of the mortise there, so I'm going to fill that in. The shim is in, so that will hopefully stop any compression from the truss rod. Okay, so I've got a bit of wood here, just on the neck, and that's, I know that, I've, I've, I know, I've tested the bottom edge of that, it's a perfect straight edge on the top edge, so that's a straight edge, and I put another straight edge on the end of the neck. I was sighting along the neck, and I was thinking there was a, perhaps a faint twist in the neck, and lo and behold, this verifies that, only very faintly. Can you see that the left hand is slightly lower 
than the right side in comparison to the wooden bar at the top. That means the neck is very, is very slightly twisted that way so some wood needs to come off this side here in order to tilt that bar, tilt it more that way. You can also see it if you're looking down from this way. See how the left side is, looks a bit higher than the top? I've got this um, levelling beam which is um, it's for levelling frets on a guitar. This side is ground, milled and lapped to be, you know, very very flat basically. So um, good for doing this really. Just patiently work it until the twist is gone. Okay, you will now see the bar is on the middle and it's looking pretty level. I've got a spirit level there which is even straighter than the bit of wood. Three quarters of the way along the neck now and there we are right at the uh, the very edge of the neck, the very end of the neck where the nut would be, looking pretty straight. Okay, <clears throat> my truss rod has arrived. I was going to make one, but then I saw one online from allparts.co.uk, which perfectly fits. So it would stop there, and that's where it comes to an end. That undoes through the end block. A screwdriver head like a cross-headed Phillips screwdriver. This happens just to be the perfect length. This is a single action truss rod just because I don't really want an excess of metal in the neck for tonal reasons, just a personal thing. But it's obviously got to be long enough to extend from about here. You know, the nut's going to be there, so about there. And then just um, a little bit protruding then from the end block underneath here then the washer goes on there and then you can tighten it up. I've still got to make a router truss rod channel and the truss rod channel in order for the truss rod to work it needs to be slightly curved so it sort of starts off here and curves ever slightly lower till it gets to about here and then it kind of levels off you know basically because it's curved then when you tighten this end it kind of um, wants to straighten out when you when you tighten it because if, if it's put in the neck and it's curved when you tighten up it it wants to pull itself straight and that that action is what pulls the neck this into this direction you know so if you've got too much of a bow a forward bow in the neck then it, it straightens it out so in, in order to avoid hacking up my plans all the time, every time I want to do something, I bought this grease-proof paper to act as tracing paper. So I'm just going to trace the, the outline of the neck. Alright, um, I'm just going to eyeball this, <coughs> for better or worse. Okay, so I'm going to have the, the end of the headstock about 5 millimeters in from the, from the nut. And looking down above, it needs to be kind of, that's halfway, the blue rod is kind of halfway between the, the two lines there. I'd have it sort of just over halfway, something about like that. And the curve needs to go to about this point here where the rod needs to be kind of at that kind of height, yeah? So it needs between here and here there needs to be a curve all right and then after after kind of like here it can kind of go quite straight make sure we're where we want to be like i say just over halfway as i showed you right at that put a net a little nail there see where my thumb is that's the kind of height it needs to be at and then to run straight off from there ash it in Okay, so now that I've got these two nails in, all I have to do is pull on the central point of those two nails to get a curve. Take a pencil, but make sure you keep the pencil so that it's in line with the edge of the thing. You don't want to go too deep like that because you're going to write further in or too much like that. You want to kind of keep it at this, the same angle. All right, so get, get the line drawn in. got the curve starting there you've got a nice gentle curve there coming in there there's the other nail going off then I forgot to continue the curve 
up to this part, that up to this side here. And I'll draw that in now. Okay, so I'm going to now cut along the curve. Okay, so we're left with this. So here's the curve I originally drew along the side of the truss rod. So that's the right curve. This is a straight line. Alright, so I've got my strip of paper glued down. You just need to paint over it. And then peel the paper off. So now I've got a nice clear line to saw along. So this is a band saw job. Okay, you need to make the jig about, say, seven odd centimetres longer on each end than the actual length of the slot that you're going to cut to um, make it easier to clamp it down as you'll see. Okay, so I've got my little fence set up there. Okay, now I get a hacksaw blade. I've got a bit of tape wrapped around that to stop it hurting my little fingers. I just get a needle file. It's a nice you know, professional tungsten carbide, two fluted, straight cutting bit with a 5.5 millimeter diameter. Okay, the router's not plugged in. Never handle this when the router's plugged in, obviously. Put my router bit now, cutting to a depth of 18 and a half millimeters. <clears throat> okay, we'll do another test piece just to be on the safe side. Um, here I've drawn the outline of the neck as it appears on the plans. Better safe than sorry, do a test and then I'll measure the depth of the ruler all the way I'll make sure because the last thing you want to do is route through the neck. Okay, so here's the jig set up. Um, the nut line is there, so I want the cut to, to end slightly in from the nut. I've measured the distance between the edge of the guide bush and the edge of the router cutter. That's 5.5 millimetres, so this stock is 5.5 millimeters past the point where I want the cutting to stop. Release the router so the bit isn't sticking out. All right. Put the guy bush in the slot. Push to the max to the end. Um, then start the router. Slowly depress it till you start. You'll hear it when it starts to cut. And just only have. You know, to go in cuts of say a quarter of a centimeter, like uh, two mil, something like that, two or three mil, go in cuts like that. Okay, so this is important now. I've done the test piece, it's a nice straight cut. What I'm gonna do, what I'm gonna do now, what I want to avoid is routing a channel again that's off center. I've drawn a centre line on the neck of the guitar. Look down on the groove you've made. Mark the centre point. Get the pencil, right? Put it in the slot and then slide it. As the pencil passes over, you can see, oh, that's dead centre. And then just push it to the edge and then you've got the, you've got the perfect centre marked. Same on the other side. Push it. It don't get much more central than that. See that little dot there? There, that's the perfect center. All I have to do is line that up to the center line of the guitar. That's the perfect center of the slot. I've got the other dot there, see it? Got this piece of wood with a bit of uh, cardboard on it to put on it so as not to mark it. Don't over tighten, you don't want to start cracking your soundboard. I've got my um, piece there fitted. So this would then go and fit like here. You want to cut fractionally, you know, well, just half a mil or a mil through the end block, you know, just to pass the truss rod through. You don't want to go any further, really. Clamp here, clamp here, get the dots aligned. We'll give it a shot. Let's do this thing.
it is absolutely smack bang perfect central so that finally is the truss rod slot routed so again once more i've got to drill out a, a slot here use a drill bit right put the drill bit to the depth that the slot is so you know you can't go deeper than that okay so i got a piece of tape there on my drill bit um, that's the depth to which i'm gonna drill to um, then come in with a chisel and you can kind of clean it out you know okay so i've cut that t-slot um, using a drill bit to start off with and then just using a sharp chisel and um, a needle file to uh, make it accommodate the head of the truss rod. So take the truss rod, pass it through, remember it came with a washer, right so you can see the truss rod there, stick the washer on, stick the nut on, just sort of get it started. You go in, uh, tilt it that way to go under the brace then put something under the neck at the point where the truss rod ends and just gently tap it in <clears throat> so the, I've got the truss rod in that is spot on perfect central okay so I've got this fillet cut out I created that by putting the template, the jig rather, onto a piece of uh, mahogany which I cut to the appropriate width of 6mm. I drew a pencil line on it then and then I just um, used the, the belt sander and just sanded it down to the line. So that curve matches exactly the curve on the inside of here and it just pushes nice snug fit so I'm just going to trim that a little bit to uh, to make it fit in and then we'll glue it in. So I've been quite sparing with the glue there. Just use a chisel to uh, clear off the, 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 the squeeze out or a rag. I thought a rag would be just as good. Okay so I got that clamped up all ready to dry. Note I only put glue and a very little bit sparing bit of glue on either side of the fillet. Didn't put any glue in the channel or in the bottom of the fillet because I want to get you know the absolute minimum of glue on the truss rod itself. I don't want the truss rod itself being clamped up with glue. Okay, so that's the fillet sanded nice and flush with the with the neck. All right, so here's the fingerboard to be. What we're going to do now is to mark out the frets. Okay, so I flip this round now just so you can see better. So the, I'm, going to, I'm going to be marking it in inches because my calipers are in inches. Um, so this is a perfect right angle. I've got this, the centre line drawn in white and then a ruler, which is the end of which is perfectly aligned with the end of the fretboard, yeah? Perfectly. And then you need to know, you know where your frets are going to be. I'm lucky in that the, the values are given on um, on the plans I've got, so I know the distance of the first fret because it's given on the plans. I know the dis every distance of each fret is given on the plans, and I think most plans that you get would would have those distance already calculated. But if they're not, then I asked the guy who drew my plans, Ricky Brunette, and he said he went to the stumac.com fret calculator, and uh, I just went and double checked, you know? So it's a lot easier if you just go to that site. This, it's probably not the only site that does it. Type in the scale length you, you, um, that you're using, the number of frets, and it'll tell you exactly the number of, the, the distances of each fret. That's far easier than trying to calculate each one. You, you know, it's a lot of maths to do. Okay, so I've just got a couple of clamps holding that ruler down firmly. Seems to me the best way of doing it, given what I've got, is to use this ruler. They said in the hardware store there that it was a very accurate ruler. Just have to take their word for it, I suppose. So, I've got the ruler perfectly aligned at the end of the fretboard. This is a perfect right angle. And I've got the centre line drawn in to which the ruler is also aligned. So what I'm going to do is I've got these calipers which are imperial in inches so I'm just 
You can get these for next to nothing on eBay, like two quid. You, you can even get digital ones, which are which are better for like two pounds. Some I've seen them for that, you know, pennies really. If I align that perfectly with the very edge of the fretboard. So this part of the caliper's got two points, like you know. So just look along, align those two points perfectly. So use a sharp knife now. Mark that point, all right, and that leaves a mark. Then, what's the next fret? Now, rather than start from the fret mark I've already made, which could result in an error, distortion, you know, because maybe if I got that one slightly wrong, then that one's going to be slightly wrong. So it's better to start from zero again. Starting from the zero position again. Mark it, mark it exactly with a knife. Okay, so my calipers only went about six inches wide. So for frets beyond that, uh, sc beyond the scope of the calipers, I had to rely on a combination of using the ruler and the calipers together. You know, mar finding a mark on the ruler and then finding the fraction uh, the, after the decimal point using the calipers, and um, that's why it's important to have a ruler that's as accurate as possible. That's the way I did it, and it turned out fine. Um, however, there are other ways. You can actually buy fingerboards which are pre-slotted uh, if you want to make things easier for yourself. Um, or you can actually buy jigs, fret slot cutting jigs um, with sort of uh, which will cut the slots exactly in the right place. So there's uh, a number of ways to do it. So I'm going to just carry on marking these, get these frets marked using my digital calipers and the ruler. That's as good as I can get it. Okay, check it out. There's a zero position. First mark, second mark, third mark, fourth mark, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth. You get the idea. And I'm going all the way up there. Score number two, number three, number four, etc. I'm coming in at nine and a half, so that means that the nine and a half millimeters. That means that the fingerboard is one millimeter too thick, which is how I want. This is kind of like medium sort of fret wise, seventy-seven thousandths of an inch. This bit with the barbs on it—that's called the tang, right? And that is. About, about a millimetre and a half. So if I cut fret slots to two and a half millimetres for now, then we should be okay. They should be slightly deeper than the fret tang. I've bought a special fretting saw from Tone Tech Luthia Supplies. And I bought this saw at the same time that I bought the fret wire. And the guy on the phone at Tone Tech assured me that the fret wire matches fret saw. All right, so I've taken his word for that. Otherwise, the frets are, slots are too narrow when you put the frets in. It can, you know, cumulatively over the whole fingerboard, put a back bow into the fingerboard. Locate the groove on the edge and score it like that. Just, just one way. Right, and then get the same on the other side. And score it that way. And just sort of score it that way and bring it a little bit lower. You know. And start it off like that, and then you can kind of meet them both sides up, you know. So you can kind of, you know, push it this way, get it lower, get this one, you know, a bit lower like that, and then meet them both up, and then you get a nice clean line then. And I tend to, I, you know, with this, I, uh, I tend to just get that established, get that groove really well established, you know. Just going one way, 
All right, so once you've got that kind of groove well established, then you can start pulling it back like that. And, you know, just by eye, make sure you're trying to keep keep it at, at 90 degrees. Got uh, a little permanent marker mark on, um, on this knife here. I can test the depth with that. Okay, so that's the fingerboard. Now slotted. Uh, we'll just cut it out roughly first. Okay, so I've got the fingerboard on. Well, it's not glued on, just resting on. So where it starts to angle down, that's where the nut should start. And hey presto, it's also, when you look down above, the very edge of the sides should be down the middle of the 14th fret, according to the plans. And that all tallies up nicely. Right, look at the plans there. You can see where the fingerboard ends. I've made the mark here with the fretboard down. I'm just going to cut that off straight and then perhaps round the edges off a little bit. Okay, so I've sawn the end of that fingerboard off. Okay, so um, we're coming now to actually gluing the fingerboard on. Before I do that, I'm going to drill a couple of holes in the fretboard through to the neck. Only very shallow holes. Stick a couple of nails in just to hold it in place when I glue it down. Just to make sure it doesn't slip out of place when I, when I start clamping it up. Um, so I've got a little drill bit here. This is the fret wire I'm going to use in. So obviously this fret wire needs to be you know, a good bit thicker than the drill bit, which it is. Alright, so I've got the fingerboard clamped on. I've aligned the central line here, the central line here, with the centre of the guitar. Okay, so I've got a bit of tape on the old uh, drill bit indicating 7.5mm, so I don't want to get, go any deeper than that tape. Obviously, the hole should be drilled in a fret slot, not to mark the fingerboard. Um, and then that hole will be covered by the fret then. Okay, so um, when I bought the drill bits, they came in a pack or two, so I've actually used the drill bits which actually mi match the, the hole size, obviously, exactly better than those nails. So that's now solid. I'm going to shift anywhere. But now I just need to come up with some bits, blocks of wood, you know, to be able to clamp this down whilst having those pins in there. Okay, so I've got these bits of wood to clamp onto the fingerboard whilst allowing space for the uh, these drill bits to hold it in place, stop it sliding out of position. And then I made this bit here, with this bit cut out of it, that um, goes inside the sound hole. The bit is cut out to stop it pushing on the truss rod, you know? So I can clamp down on this. Notice I've got a separate block here because at this angle, from this point onwards, there's a slight, you know, change in angle. So I've got a separate block here after, and I make sure that it, that block starts after the edge of the the body to to really clamp it down firmly. Okay, so here we are all clamped up. The center line there is smack bang perfect. <coughs> okay, the clamps are off. Got my straight edge aligned perfectly with the center line. The center line goes right the way down, hits here. And it matches perfect, perfectly. So now I've just got the guitar gently clamped. Gonna bring the mahogany wood of the neck, which was just roughly, remember I, I cut it slightly wider than it needed to be. So um, now I'm just gonna trim it flush with the actual edge of the fingerboard, which I know to be a, a true straight line.
I'm just working to even up this headstock, get this nice and symmetrical. It wasn't quite symmetrical, just sort of doing it by eye. And then I'll sand it nice and smooth once I've got it to the right shape. Okay, so I've sanded the edge of the neck nice and flat with the fingerboard on both sides. Now I'm just going to work on the neck roughly by eye to get it a bit more into shape, rounded off. Okay, so I've pretty much got the neck as I want it now. What I want to do is to get this to conform to the curve of the, the back of the guitar so it comes down like that, follows a nice even curve, you know? I'm just going to use this hacksaw to cut um, a heel piece shaped bit on here. Make a heel cap for uh, for there. So I've got this little bit of rosewood that I glued on. Another little trick is to um, get a contour gauge and push it on. I push it on to fit this side perfectly. And you can just uh, put it on the other side, see what needs to be done. Okay, so I'm kind of done for now. There may be a little bit further finessing further along the line, but we'll leave it at that for now. Okay, so now I've got this bit of veneer to the correct thickness. I'm going to pick that side to go on the outside. Okay, so glue that veneer on, sanded it flush, get the profile, get it symmetrical on both sides. The headstock needs to go a little bit thinner in order to accommodate both that nut and and the washer. All right, so I've got the calipers set to the right distance. So this gap now is the correct distance. I've locked this on. Peel off the paper, and we've got six little holes. Starting off with a little small bit, you know. Moving on to a slightly bigger bit now, with a hole a bit bigger. So what you need to do is to drill a hole the same diameter as that bushing. And then you need to, on the back side of the headstock, you need to drill a hole of that width, accommodate that wider bit. But you only drill it as deep as that bit is. They don't push in, but they screw in. So I've got my bit, got my bit of tape on, don't go no deeper than the tape.
I'm going to make a slot for the nut now. I've designed this in Photoshop. I bought this piece of mother of pearl, right, which I bought off the internet for two pounds. Now I'm going to mix up some epoxy resin. First of all, I'm going to make some sawdust with this offcut of rosewood that I've got. Mix the epoxy together, some into the hole. Now replace the uh, piece of mother of pearl. Now get the sawdust and mix that in with the uh, the rest of the stuff. This is a slow drying epoxy, so I've got 15 minutes to to mess around with it. Smear it into the gaps, it's only going to get sanded off later, isn't it? Okay, so now a couple of hours later, just sanding this smooth. Progressing now to 120 grit. Just finishing off with a bit of wire wool. Now we're going to be doing a little bit of planing or sanding of the fingerboard to get it to the right height. I've marked in the white centre line, I've marked it on the end of the fingerboard here and also on the end of the fingerboard here where it's also the seam where the soundboard, soundboard joins. I've marked it on the end there because obviously that white line is going to get rubbed off. I'll just um, use um, this levelling bar, which um, I bought to level frets with. Um, that I think just uh, it's very light grey sandpaper. Obviously, I'm taking a fine, tiny amount off here, but I'm fine taking my time over this. Okay, that's all looking pretty flat to me now. There's not no light showing through. And then just move this little bit off, very fine spray sandpaper and a sanding block just up to the edge of the body. Look at the end of that fingerboard, yeah? Can you see it's got a very slight curve to it? Well, we want to re oh, I like the feel of this guitar, so I'm going to try and reproduce something like that. But it's not that straightforward, because on the guitar it's what's called a um, compound radius, I think. In the sense that it's not like the edge of a cylinder, it's more like the edge of a cone. You no, know, the arc here is the same as the arc here, proportionate to the width, you know? Okay, so with this compound radius, the way you work it out, you know, I'm starting off, a fairly standard radius is 14 inches. Remember that a radius, you've got a circle. Radius is the distance from the centre of the circle to the edge. Alright, so that's, that's the radius. It's normal to have a radius of about 14 inches um, at the 12th fret on an acoustic guitar. It's a fairly standard one. That's what I'm going for. So 14 inches at the 12th fret is the radius I'm going for. Now I've measured the 12th fret, the width of the fingerboard at the 12th fret on my guitar with my calipers, and it's 2.284 inches. Alright, so on the 12th fret is that, so at that, at that um, point on the fretboard the radius sh should be 14 inches. Zero fret I've measured on my fretboard, fingerboard, the zero fret is 1.740 inches. Okay, so it's obviously, you know, narrower than that. And what you need is a proportional radius. 
okay? Well, what I've done, what, it, what you need to be able to do is to work out a proportion of, what proportion this is of this in order to get this value here, all right? So what we do, we take um, 1.740, which is the width of the zero fret, divide it by 2.284, all right? And then multiply that by 100, and then we get what percentage this is of this, all right? So take the calculator. So, 76.18. So, um, 1.740 is 76.18% of 2.284. So, 76.18% of 14 will give the radius for the zero fret. Alright, so let's calculate that then. 10.6652, so call it 10.67 then, yeah, let's round it up. Because this is a 5, then we round this number up to the next, uh, next number, so it's 10.67. Alright, so that, 10.67 inches, is what the radius should be at the zero fret. And then you might want to do one more calculation for, say, call it the ninth fret. There's a drill bit in there with a point. Obviously, I've got a pencil taped here. There's just two bits of wood with a screw at the top there, and they open like that, right? The twelfth fret, we want 14 inches. Okay, you've got 14 inches there. So then draw that circle like that. Okay. And then what you do, you have three radiuses there, three radii, sorry. I've got a little bit of car there, which is exactly the width of the zero fret position and I've got the radius I'm going for there. I've got the 12th fret position and the, the very end of the fret bar. I decided to go for the 0, the 12th fret and the very end. I have three equidistant uh, radii. What I want to do is um, try and put a bit of a rounded edge onto the, to the plane blades. Check period periodically with a straight edge. Make sure it's all a nice straight line, there's no light appearing under there. Brad point drill bit. Brad point means it's got that pointy bit on the end, so you can. It's easier to centre and get the hole drilled exactly where you want it drilled without it, you know, skewing off all over the place. All right. So I'm just going to do a, a test hole on this bit of offcut of rosewood. Oh, perfect! Perfect. Fits perfectly. Okay, I've drawn a white line back in down the centre of the fingerboard. First dot is going to be on the one, two, three, four, fifth fret. Okay, I've got all my holes drilled, so now I'm going to mix up a little bit of epoxy resin like I did with the inlay on the headstock, exactly the same process. A tiny little dab on the on the uh, dot, and just place that baby in there. The rest of this epoxy I'm mixing with this finely ground sawdust. To clean up any excess around the dot, I don't, 
Don't have to make any more sanding work for myself than is necessary. So again, I just use this motion. The first fret there, look at that, nice. Twelfth fret, nice. And uh, it's also good on the end. That is flat as flat can be. Obviously you've got the fall away at the top there, but that's good, you want that. Wire wall now. What I've done here is just taken a bit of a, an off cut of wood and I've drilled 25 holes in. You want the fret wire to be a slightly smaller radius than the radius of the fret slots. Because then, when you put the frets in, you tap one end down, you tap the other end down, and then you tap the middle down, and it kind of pushes the end of the fret outwards like that and so they slide in and it's harder for them to come back out then. Obviously this fret wire is extruded, it's got grease and oil on it and stuff so um, in order to help the fret stick firmly, they don't want to be lubricated with that oil, they might tend to lift and pop out so you've got to clean them. Get a, a cotton pad, pull that wire through you know. I would say leave like three mil on each end and then just mark it with your thumb and then just I'm coming in with a pair of pliers here. Okay, that's number three. Put it in the hole. Okay, so I'm going to try to cut the fret slots now to the appropriate depth because what with rounding off the, putting the camber into the fingerboard, it's, it may have made some of those slots too too narrow. They're not following the camber. So I've got a bit of fret wire. All right, I've got my calipers there. You can see how much how much deeper calipers is. Just a tiny bit deeper than the fret wire itself. Okay, so I've got this knife depth is marked so I don't want to go any deeper than that with my saw. Okay, just run the blade of the knife through the groove to clear out any dust that's accumulated what with all the uh, sanding. So just a question of coming in just emphasizing that side to go better to take your time just go gentle you don't want to overcut these. Obviously on these higher frets use a bit of card to uh, stop yourself from sawing into the soundboard. Right, this part here, that's called the tang, right? And this part here is called the crown. And uh, in this corner here, this corner edge, because this stuff is extruded, which this angle here is not always perfectly 90 degrees. So by using the corner of this file to uh, sort of bevel off the edges, there's a better chance, higher probability of the fret wire sitting nicely flush to the surface of the fingerboard. Go ahead and try and install these frets. I'm going to glue them in with epoxy resin. Shouldn't really have to glue them in because it's a new fingerboard, new frets. It should hold by themselves, but just to be on the safe side, I'm going to glue them in. I've got this epoxy resin. It's quite slow setting, but it takes 15 minutes to go off. It's got to be well mixed, obviously, for the chemistry to work. Got a 100% cotton old t shirt here. Got some white spirits here, fresh cocktail stick. All I'm doing, as you can see, I'm just transferring the glue from the cocktail stick. Pay special attention to the ends. I've taken fret number one out. One sharp bang here. And then a sharp bang on the middle. As you can see, it's pretty well seated. Now I've taken this cloth, which I dampened, go down the side of the fret. And clean up any squeeze out now. Okay, same thing all the way along. Okay, so for this last bit of um, the fingerboard, obviously this point is there where the angle changes because this angle is going like that and then the fingerboard here conforms to the to the angle of the sample. So you've got this angle coming here and then you've got a slight angle change. So I'm going to um, use this and I'm going to hold that there while doing the hammering here. I 
bought uh, these nippers and um, I used my draper tool with a sanding bit on the end and I, I used that, I, I clamped the nippers down and just worked on the face of these okay. to grind them flush and flat. There we go. These bits, be careful, they're ultra sharp and be careful with your fingers on the side here because it's mega sharp, you'd cut yourself very easily. Right. Okay, so we're going to move on to leveling the frets now, but before you do that you need to check, double check that the neck is still straight. It should be if you've used a leveling bar as I've shown to, uh, you know, sand the neck completely flat when putting the compound radius in. It should still be straight, but if the fret tangs were, you know, quite wide in comparison to the fret slot, then it's possible that you may have uh, put a slight back bow into the neck so you need to just check that and uh, if you refer to this diagram you can see that you've got uh, the neck and uh, a straight edge a ruler and underneath the ruler you've got like three black oblongs um, what I find is particularly good for this is uh, a screwdriver, a ratchet set with uh, those different screwdriver attachments, anything of a uniform height and if you place one little object, for example like I say a screwdriver att attachment on the first fret and then on the 14th fret where the neck joins the body and also uh, and then a, uh, a third one halfway between them and place a straight edge on top, on top as you can see in the diagram then you will be able to see uh, whether the neck is straight or not and if a slight back bow has been caused by installing the frets then you need to adjust the truss rod tighten the truss rod slightly to uh, counter the the back bow and once you've got the straight edge you know touching all three of the little objects it could be three nuts you know like from a nut and bolt they would do three nuts anything of a uniform height uh, but you have to make sure they are of a uniform height use a calipers just to uh, make sure that they are you know as uh, as as closely of, of the same height as possible um, like I say those screwdriver attachments are machined pretty precisely so uh, they make good uh, good uh, objects for this exercise and uh, yeah and uh, make sure the neck is straight and then you can move on to the next stage. Okay, so I've got two strips of market masking tape going down the side and then when I put the other masking tape on I'll lay it across here and then when it comes to peel it off you can just take the edge of the this edge of the the tape that you put on first and then you can pull it all off in one. I'm just going to use this mark, masking tape to mask off the fingerboard so I've got my fretboard all masked off so I'm going to come in with a permanent marker now and mark each fret top there are. so I've got all my fret tops covered with permanent marker now all the markers have been removed from all the tops of the frets or on this area of the fretboard I'm not, I haven't done this body part yet okay the objective here is only to continue leveling to the point where the permanent marker has been removed from the tops of each and every fret. On some frets, as you can see here, only the very top will have been lightly kissed. On other frets, more uh, of the fret will have been removed because obviously the frets are at different heights. So don't worry if the frets vary 
in appearance from one to the other that's perfectly normal all you have to do is to ensure that you've removed the marker from the from the very tops of the frets and then you, you stop there <laughs> What I've done, I've got this three corner file and what I've done is I've ground the edges smooth and what you need to do is to look down or over the fret, just keep an eye on that, don't wear any of the marker off the very centre of the paint, you need to sort of angle it and then work on the other side and angle it a bit more. And this is what the fret should end up looking like with a tiny thin sliver of permanent marker going down the very centre of the fret which means that on, the string will only contact with that part of the fret. If we take a look at a cross section of how a fret should look like, you can see that it's nice and rounded and uh, this will help to ensure accurate intonation because the string needs to be at the very center of the make contact at the center of the fret. If the fret is flat, then obviously it's going to shift the pitch um, and make it sharper. Alright, I've got some wet and dry sandpaper here. This is 400 grit, right? So I start off with a piece of this. Going down now to uh, uh, 300. This time I'm going to go along the frets just to remove those scratches from the 400 grit. Try and get into the into the sides. Uh, now I'm going to this. It's just 600. Okay, and now I'm going to go up and down with some 400. Now I'm going to go over with 600, just on the tops. Now I'm going to go across them with some wire wool. Obviously the fine grade wire wool. But wear a dust mask for this because it's probably not very good for you to breathe it in. All nice and shiny. Just using um, a bit of lemon oil for fingerboards with a soft cotton rag just to clean off any last little traces of masking tape. I've got to rub the finish off here because we've got to glue the bridge on here. Always sanding with the grain obviously. Okay so at this stage you probably want to give the guitar a going over with sandpaper. I'd start off with 80 grit. 100 grit, 150, 200, um, basically work down to say 600 grit, depending on how ultra fine a finish you want. I've put some masking tape on this bridge area now. What I've done here, I've, just, I've got a bit of uh, grease proof paper through which I've traced the bridge. I've stuck that grease proof paper down on top of the marking tape, obviously keeping it aligned perfectly. So I've got the guitar strung up now, got my true oil, a little goes a long way with this stuff. Incidentally, after I sanded the guitar, I brushed it all down, I brushed all the dust off it, you know, just using a dustpan and brush.
You may recall this little piece of rosewood from the beginning of the film. So I've put some print stick paper glue on there and uh, I've used this grease proof paper to trace the outline of the bridge from the plans. So you see this bit of the plans, I traced over it with my grease proof paper and then cut it out and stuck it on a bit of card so I've got a profile of that now. Okay, so I've used the template to sketch in these wing lines. Sandboard to get the right contour into it. So the bridge is more or less to the right of the dimensions now. What I'm going to do is go over it with 240 grit, then go over it with 400 grit, then go over the 600 grit to get it nice and shiny. I'm just going to rub it on this uh, this levelling beam I've got, just to get a perfect straight edge. I've got this edge as a perfect straight edge now. The bridge is in is where it should be. So I've got the, the nut pushed firmly up against the end of the fingerboard. Ruler is perfectly flush butted up against the nut. The central line is perfect. So we've used a ruler to position the bridge in the correct place according to the plans. Once you've got it in the correct place, as shown in the photo, perhaps make two tiny little pencil dots along the edge of the bridge so that you can uh, reposition it exactly there when it comes time to gluing it. And then we take a ruler, make sure the nut is firmly abutted to the end of the fingerboard, make sure the ruler follows the center line, and then use a craft knife to mark in the scale length which is probably something like 25 and a half inches if you're making a standard dreadnought guitar so um, you know that will obviously the scale length will obviously be given on your plans so mark it in using a craft knife like I'm doing here on a guitar, I've got my handy old Gibson Epiphone here. You've got the distance from the nut, right, from the fretboard edge, from, from where the string starts, comes out from the nut, the edge of the nut, to the bridge. What happens when you fret a note, when you press the string, that actually stretches the string of, uh, and it raises the pitch of the string. And because of that, the saddle has to be set back further than the scale length in order to compensate this bridge position is is kind of slanted so that the the bridge is furthest away from the nut at the base side because the string needs more compensation than a thinner string up here which when you press you don't have to work quite so hard to press that string and therefore you're not stretching it as much so intonation on the guitar so that it plays in tune so that this note on the 12th fret the harmonic matches that that should all um, you know be as close as it possibly can be for the guitar to, to be in tune so this is directly from the stumac.com fret calculator page and it's for the typical 25.5 inch scale length of a standard acoustic dreadnought guitar and as you can see um, the treble E or the first string should actually the breaking angle of the string that means basically the point where it comes off of the saddle um, is 25.589 inches so slightly more than tw the, the, the 25.5 scale length in order to compensate for you know the string being stretched when it's pressed down and on the base side it's 25.715 and if you look at this picture here you can see that I've marked in these lines in comparison to the 
25.5 inch scale length line to which the pencil is pointing here. It would also be a good idea to mark in another line representing the line along which the bridge pin holes will be drilled and you'll see why uh, later on. So you need to drill uh, sorry you need to draw a line representing the scale length 25 and a half inches um, or wh whatever it is on your uh, on your plans then mark in another line for the compensation for the treble string mark in another line um, for the bass string and a final line um, for the, uh, the the line representing the, the line along which the bridge pins will be drilled and obviously make sure all these lines are perpendicular at 90 degrees to the center line running through the guitar so take a look at this picture of the first fret on my Epiphone acoustic note how the first thinnest string is set in quite away from the edge of the fingerboard and the same with the sixth string it's also set in from the edge and this is to obviously prevent the strings from falling off the edge when you're fretting chords and uh, perhaps uh, using vibrato on notes you need them to be set in a bit you know so that they don't uh, like I say fall off the edge of the frets you need to guard against that and you also need to guard against beveling the edges of the frets too much uh, to prevent the strings from slipping off the edge when you're doing vibrato and that's why I, I said go for uh, you know like a 35 degree bevel um, and here we've got a picture on the 12th fret as well uh, sorry on the on the 20th fret and you can see uh, it's the same uh, proportions uh, that the uh, first thinnest string is set in and the sixth string is set in and so what you can tell from these photographs is that the strings the, the sixth and the first strings run parallel to the edges of the fingerboard and you need to emulate these sort of distances you can just judge it by eye okay so in this photo you can see I've drawn some dots on the second from last fret and it's to the outside edge of those dots that I'll align my straight edge in order to draw in the points for the bridge pin holes of the first and sixth string. All right, so I've got my dots marked in, my white pencil nice and sharp. The bridge is firmly taped in the in the correct position, so it's perfectly aligned now. Edge in with my find the line that I've got as the bridge pin, just without knocking the ruler, go right up to the edge and make a mark. Okay, so with the edge of the ruler following the path that the string will take parallel to the edge of the fingerboard and set in a slight distance uh, in, a, in alignment with the outside edge of the dots that you've drawn. You now need to make two marks with a knife on the treble side. One mark is along at the point on the line along which the bridge pin holes will be drilled and that's given on your plans and the second mark along the line that you've already drawn in which represents the treble side compensation. Then you need to do the same for the other side. Align the edge of the ruler to uh, parallel to the edge of the fingerboard and make uh, your two marks on the base side as well. And if I join those two marks up with a pencil, as I'm doing here, you've got the center line for the saddle slot, which you can see here. And obviously we need to continue this saddle slot slightly past the bridge pins on both sides. Okay, so these white lines here are where the bridge slot should stop and in order to get it to stop there I need to remember the distance between the edge of the guide bush on the router and the cutting bit to the middle is 8.5 millimeters so I need to set up another little uh, blockade here for the router to run in. Okay so here's the bridge here I've sort of imprisoned it a little bit 
that bridge won't move at all. Um, this isn't fixed yet, but it will be. It's all screwed down. Got this angle perfectly worked out. So uh, a stop here. So I'm just going to start the router and make sure it's always pushed up against that. And um, do this uh, route this slot out in several passes. Okay, so that's what we've ended up with. We've got the bass and treble six string and the first string pinholes calculated. So let's measure that distance with the old calibers. All right, so if I take that 2.624 and divide it by five, that will give me distances from one pinhole to another. There's actually five spaces between the strings. So if you divide it by five, you will end up with six strings. Okay, so I've made my little holes using the uh, pointy bits on the caliper and I've Draw a white circle around them just to make sure I know where I'm drilling. These are the bridge pins, all right, that um, came with the pack I got. I think they're probably standard bridge bridge pins. They're 4.5 millimeters wide at the narrowest point. You need to drill a hole that's at least as wide as the end of that bridge pin. So a 4.5 millimeter drill bit will do it. A brad point drill bit to make sure you get it perfectly centered. <laughs> All right, so my holes are drilled. What you do is just gently sort of expand the top of the hole, but only gently. So you, you want the pin so that it pushes down, fits snugly. You can use a drill bit to create a countersink on the holes as shown here, and then fine tune a little bit with the, uh, the three cornered needle file to get the bridge pins to fit s snugly. So you can appreciate the difference there between the clean wood and the finish on top to uh, use. And this, remember this when I... Uh, the bridge plate to the soundboard. So if I put that inside, because you've got bracing going here, it's hard to get... I've got this very, it's very loosely clamped, so this can shift around, yeah? On the central point, it can pivot. The centre line is aligned perfectly. Well, now it is. Okay, second thing, I've got the nut clamped here, butted right up against the end of the, of the fretboard. Okay, so we just need now to double check the measurements using the ruler on the treble side from the nut to the breaking angle of the string as given by the Stumac fret calculator that uh, compensatory distance that we m mentioned earlier that should be down the center of the slot on both the treble and the bass sides and you may need to manipulate the bridge a little bit to make sure it's perfect on both the bass and treble sides and once it is then you can clamp the bridge down more firmly I'll slip a bridge pin in there straight away to stop that part of the bridge shifting. Get a bridge pin in. The bridge is in position. The two pins holding up. Okay, so um, I've just made this call. I just epoxied a couple of bits of MDF which I sanded to the right height so that the bridge fits on it's when it's clamped. These wings of the bridge also get pushed firmly down, you know. Place the bridge on, it located with the holes. Okay, so I just used a tiny drop of A and R the tight bond yellow wood glue that I've been using throughout the project to glue the nut in place and you know it's kind of held but a, a slight tap with a hammer would uh, loosen it 
and here I am just filing it down to the correct width. Take the saddle and sand it on a flat surface to get it to fit snugly and use a file uh, or a sanding stick and then a sanding stick to round off the ends to get it to fit nicely into the saddle slot as you can see here. Notice that this edge of the saddle is like mega sharp, you know, so it's like a right angle. The string is more likely to break if you've got a sharp edge there. And they... Okay, I've just got a very slight rounded edge on that, only a very slight one, just to take the bite off the edge. Okay, so it's time to get uh, the guitar strung up. I personally like Elixir strings. They've got like a very thin coating on. They've got a lovely tone as far as I'm concerned and uh, they last sort of three times longer than uh, normal strings. Mind you, they are sort of three times the price, but uh, you know, say la vie. All right, so what I do with the strings, I bring it round and then I'd wrap it round that way a couple of times. It just saves a lot of winding, you know. Look down an eyeball where you think you've got the string parallel. Get it until you think, yeah, that looks. That the string looks to be a parallel line with this. Okay, so you can see on the nut, got a slot marked here. So I'll obviously cut to the centre of that line and a slot marked here. I got this, which is like for, for, for filing nut slots. It's not actually designed for that. Appa apparently it was uh, it's designed for cleaning nozzles on welders. Uh, you know, it's got like round rounded files of varying widths. So what you need to do is to select a file that's slightly wider than that string, you know. You've got to keep the file going down the same angle as the headstock, you know. Okay, so we've got our strings on, very loosely. Have a fiddle with these strings and get them, li get them lying in the right places and then I'll draw either side with a pencil. Let's just, I'm holding it down like that, right, more or less, roughly, they're in the right place. We'll start off some provisional slots. After an, a not inconsiderable amount of faffing around and uh, using the calipers to, to get an equal space between, oh, I've got there. Okay, so I'm now where I'm at uh, in terms of nut action. All right, that's the, th the first thing you want to get in. The, 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 get the nut slots in the right position and the nut action. Let's look at the nut action first. So hold down on the third fret. And look at that, it's the tiniest amount. It barely moves at all. You're talking, you know, like a human hair, perhaps, even less. No string buzz. You get as close as you can without string buzz. Same on the B string. Handy hint, if you go, if you cut the nut slot too deep, which is very easily done, then all you need to do is to get some baking soda powder or baking powder, that white powder you can buy it in the supermarket for next to nothing. Uh, fill the slot with a powder and then just drop a couple of tiny drops of super glue onto it um, and let it wick into the powder and then leave that overnight and the, you know you can uh, that'll dry rock hard and you can recut the slot then 600 grit keep it slanted downward you know just give that give that slot but you're not trying to make it any deeper or wider just you're trying to polish it basically to the string the string travels nice and smoothly through it. Okay, with the strings up to pitch, you need to check the neck relief. You do this by putting a capo on the first fret with the guitar laying flat, and then use your finger to hold the string uh, on the, the sixth string down on the 15th fret. And then, as you can see in the picture, use a feeler gauge uh, to check the gap between the top of the seventh fret and the underneath of the string. And you should be going for a gap of around 11 thousandths of an inch. If you don't know what to go for, then I would go for 11 thousandths of an inch. That's a pretty standard kind of uh, neck relief. However, neck relief is a personal choice. Some players 
don't attack the strings that uh, violently and they can have a dead straight neck. Other players are really whacking the strings and they need to jack the relief up to say 15 thousandths of an inch. But if you go for 11, 12 thousandths of an inch um, at the seventh fret, like I say, with a, whilst the capo is on the first fret and you're holding at the 15th and uh, a similar gap on the other side and uh, adjust the truss rod um, accordingly to, to get that uh, kind of relief. You know, the strings may put too much relief into the neck, so you need to tighten the truss rod up a little bit then um, to, uh, to counteract that. If you're making a dreadnought acoustic, you want to go for an action of between, say, two and a half, three mil. Again, it depends on your playing style. If you're a gentle player, you know, but if you're really whacking a the guitar, then you need the action a bit higher. That's a personal preference, you know, you've got to decide what you want for yourself, you know, just experiment. I'd go for, like, say, so a hair over two and a half on the bass side and a hair over two on the trap, two mil on the treble side. All right, I just need to explain something about uh, intonation. Um, basically, the harmonic on the 12th fret should be the same as the fretted note on the 12th fret. Same on the 5th string, same on all the strings. Okay, so we've used the tuner to identify that um, the sixth string is a little bit um, sharp, I remember. All the other strings are a tiny bit flat, apart from the B string, which is a tiny bit sharp. So, what needs to be done? Well, I'm just going to take it string by string. I'll leave the other strings at, at the right tension. We'll start off on the E. Basically, the string is sharp and you need to increase the distance, the breaking point of the string, the where it breaks on, not literally where it breaks, but the point on the saddle where it comes off needs to go further away from the nut. So when that note is fretted, it's slightly flatter. Um, to make the breaking point further this way, go this way, you need to um, remove some bone from this side of the saddle. Okay, so that is the saddle adjusted. You can see where I've made the uh, various changes. Let's see what it sounds like. 